Okay, that means hello everybody. Welcome to the microfluidics session within the Compromet High Tech Forum 2020, first time as virtual event. Uh, and we are going to start now with a session on miniaturization in the life sciences and looking from the perspective from hype to reality. And it's my pleasure to announce a program that starts at 11 with promises uh, of a new technology and will go through uh, a couple of presentation and will end at 20, uh, 40 past 11 with a last presentation looking at the uh, handling of small amount of liquids. Yeah, now I would like to hand over to Holger Becker uh, from Microfluidics Ship Shop. Holger Becker is one of the old guys in microfluidics and it's real fun to discuss with him about technology, future application of microfluidics and also on business topics. Holger, the floor is yours. All right, here's the old guy speaking. And uh, I would like uh, see. Um, let's see if you can see my screen here. I would like to talk uh, with you about the promises of Microflix enabled point of care tests. I mean, what everybody wants to have is something fast, cheap, and easy. And let's have a look how Microflix um, is doing in these uh, in these areas. First of all, um, I think it's important to notice that even before our current SARS pandemic, uh, point of care was already a pretty hot topic. You can see that that's really just uh, a search for publications which have point of care test somewhere in the text, a simple Google uh, Scholar search. And you can see already that sometime around, let's say 2010 or so, um, the number of publications really was, was growing exponentially. What I find interesting actually is that you indeed can see an apparent COVID-19 impact. So if you look at the 2020 figures um, and the year is not even full, uh, you can see that probably um, we get an additional 10 to 15% of papers, which I um, attribute to, of course, being the impact. Oops, why can you can you hear me now? You were muted Very for good. a second. Oh, okay. Let's go back to this one then. Apologies because I thought I, I was unmuted. <laughs> um, so um, as I mentioned, uh, even before SARS uh, point of care was uh, already a hot topic and you could see almost an ideal exponential rise starting somewhere around 2008. Um, what is interesting is here the 2020 figures. I mean, the year is not even complete and you can see probably an additional 10 to 15% of the papers, which I would attribute to uh, COVID-19. Um, and as I mentioned, the same is happening on the commercial scale. These are data from uh, your development uh, from actually September this year, so brand new. Um, and you can see basically um, the estimated market sizes and you can see a big jump uh, in this uh, yellow column or orange column, which is a point of care, human point of care diagnostics. And again, of course, you see a, um, a certain impact on the COVID-19 here. What I find really interesting is, however, how microfluidics is seen over time uh, with respect to the markets. This is actually the 2017 market data from YOL. And you can see actually point of care is the second, this orange, sector here. And you can see that actually it was not seen as the main market for micro, microfluidics. Actually, it was more the, the pharmaceutical and life science research, this uh, green area, uh, which initially was seen as the, the biggest market for microfluidics with point of care only, quote unquote, with half a billion dollars in revenue. That clearly has changed. I mean, if you look at the current figures, we're talking about several billion and point of care being the predominant market for microfluidics. So I think the perception of the importance of microfluidics has changed here over time. Um, what actually is point of care diagnostics? And again, it shows you that uh, it's not really a brand new field. The, 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 the famous assured criterion for uh, to characterize point of care tests was 
actually introduced uh, by WHO already in 2004. And ASSURED uh, stands for Affordable, Sensitive, Specific, User-Friendly, Rapid and Robust, Equipment-Free, and Deliverable to End Users. Um, these are all fairly qualitative uh, parameters, which of course, if you go towards specific applications, have to be underpinned with more specific requirements, specifications with more measurable quantities. I would also like to point out that, of course, point of care is not something of the 21st century or so. This is an example of early point of care testing. This is urine analysis in the 11th century. You have a monk sitting here and these women bring him bottles of their morning urine and he, you can see his finger here. He's sort of tasting or smelling, um, which actually worked surprisingly well. And even before that, actually, uh, this is a, a papyrus, the famous Brooks papyrus. Uh, approximately um, 3,300 years old, so um, um, written in 1350, around 1350 BC, that actually describes a urine-based pregnancy test. So the idea is you, you take a bag with spelt and wheat seeds and you pee on it every day, and if the seeds are sprouting, you're pregnant. Amazingly enough, this is a, a test, this uh, is it's basically a lateral flow test, uh, which has a 70% sensitivity, not too bad. Um, what it lacks is initially the idea to have spelt in wheat is, you know, if just the spelt is sprouting, it would be a girl. If the wheat is sprouting, it would be a boy. That differentiation or the specificity is actually really poor. It's uh, basically zero or it's random. But again, it shows you point of care and the need for point of care is not something which only came up uh, this century. What we find as being really important when we develop point of care systems for, for our customers is that actually the actual environment in which the test is supposed to be delivered is really crucial for the system definition, which then is reflected in all the technical realization and the commercial positioning. Because obviously a point of care test, which is administered at a bedside in a hospital is different from something which is um, used in a lab in, in, a, in, a, in a ward in a hospital or in a central institution lab at a doctor's office or in a lab in a doctor's practice or at home in the field or in the pharmacy or so. And you can actually see that uh, these are just three examples of all devices which all claim to be point of care testing. And it, it becomes immediately apparent that there is not the point of care system, but it's a fairly complex landscape of requirements and technical realization of these systems. And we actually see that nowadays more of these um, developments fail um, mostly on the commercial side due to the lack of this understanding. Where in the market am I sitting? What's the application or what, what's the environment my, my system is going to be used in? So it's actually typically not so much the technical realization, which is the challenge, but really the, the system definition and the environment the system is going to be applied into. And of course, there is the promise and Microx really has, is seen as a true enabler for point of care diagnostics. And of course, I would like to remind you that this year we're celebrating 30 years of Microtask. Um, this is a sort of the most famous uh, picture out of the seminal paper from Andreas Mans, which came out 30 years ago, which shows the concept of the miniaturized total chemical analysis system. And this is another groundbreaking um, image, which of course typically um, created the image. When we talk about point of care, this is what everybody thinks about something like a handheld reader and a micro cartridge uh, where the sample gets in and you plug it in and then you, you get your results. Um, I said was launched commercially in 92. So 20 years, 28 years ago, Although the development actually started in 84. So actually it predates the, the academic concept of microtask by a couple of years. And I find this is actually definitely worth mentioning. So what's the reality when we talk about uh, microfluidic devices or point of care diagnostic devices, fast, cheap, and easy as our wishes. The first one fast. And I would in general say, yes, micro devices would fulfill this criterion. When we, took at, when we look at typical assay times, 
They range from a few minutes, typically for comparatively simple assays, to something like less than two hours for molecular diagnostic tests, cartridge-based sample in result out tests. And in my opinion, that tends to be sufficient for most applications. Of course, everybody thinks about it. it would be really cool to have something which gives you results in a minute or two. On the other hand, um, this would be more a question of convenience and not so much of medical usability. Because in reality, in most cases, at least when you do a symptomatic testing, people would be at a hospital or at a doctor's office or so for sufficient time, put it that way, to, <clears throat> for a sufficient long time to perform the diagnostic, the point of care diagnostic, and to get actionable diagnostic results while the patient is at the point of care. Anything much faster than that is more a question of convenience. And yes, people are working on that. And I, I mentioned, uh, let's say, technological improvements like a rapid photonic PCR to reduce the time, especially for molecular diagnostic testing. But in general, I think the current systems are more or less fulfilling this speed criterion. Much more challenging is uh, the cost criterion. Um, and I, I would say we mainly deal with two problems or two challenges here. The first one is that very often users and actually also people in the scientific community have fairly unrealistic expectations. Um, and I put it in parentheses here, often fueled by academic publications, because if you read these papers, very often academic groups claim they can do something for 50 cents a piece or a dollar a piece. And they talk about something like I've shown here, while what they actually mean with cost from their perspective is the raw material cost of this you know, slab of PDMS or so. Because of course, the time the PhD student sits there and connects all the tubes costs nothing. The, the clean room in which this thing is made costs nothing. This of course is an unrealistic view on how cost for a regulated diagnostic device comes from. Um, so all, all these additional other factors are not taken into account. Furthermore, from now the, the user side, very often people only look at the cost of the consumable microfig cartridge, which indeed might appear pretty high. I mean, let's say most of the molecular diagnostic cartridges sell in the marketplace for anywhere between say 25 to $200 or euros. However, <clears throat> what people of course do not take into account or very often don't take into account is the broader holistic view on the overall procedural cost or the overall cost for the healthcare system in the sense that you save lab space, you save of course time, lab time, hands-on time, especially for molecular diagnostics. So if you start to look a little bit wider into this overall healthcare cost, the cost for microfix enabled point of care diagnostics suddenly becomes actually pretty competitive. However, and that's uh, something I will, I always try to, to hammer into people's heads. I don't think there will be this, you know, everybody talks about this magic $1 point of care cartridge. I don't think that that, especially for more complex molecular diagnostics assays will ever be there because the cost of reagents are, the, are there. And of course, if you look a little bit closer into how these sample in result out cartridges typically look like, you will see that they actually consist out of a fair number of parts. Um, this is an example uh, from one of our diagnostic systems, the molecular diagnostic sample in result out cartridge for the detection of, oops, um, of tuberculosis. And what you can see, if you look into this uh, uh, drawing, you will find that actually it contains a lot of different parts. So this cartridge has nine molded parts, five membranes. It has four blisters with uh, reagents, liquid reagents. It has also, oops, why does this jump? It has uh, dry reagents and it has films to seal uh, the microchannels. So even if a single part only costs a few cents to make, 10 cents, 20 cents, whatsoever, just the number of parts and the subsequent backend processing steps, especially for assembly, are driving the cost to something which is clearly oops, above 
uh, a euro a piece. Um, let's come to the last uh, criterion, the ease of use. And uh, normally I show uh, a picture of uh, Donald Trump unboxing this, uh, um, uh, this Abbott antigen test, but I was said I should not show too many pictures of Donald Trump anymore. Um, I think this, of course, is the biggest driver for the use of point of care. The, the, the avoidance of hands-on time, the reduction of risk of, of pro procedural risk by um, misusing or by not adhering to a certain protocol, especially for things like sample prep. So you can run diagnostic tests with less skilled personnel. That in my opinion is on the commercial side, the biggest driver for the use of point of care. And on the other hand, from the microfluidics point of uh, standpoint, actually the biggest improvement in technology. I would say since five, six, seven, eight years or so, I always tell people we, we get all devices to work regardless of how complex the protocol actually is. We get all devices to work, sample in result out. And that's a true progress the technology has made. And uh, this is an example of our uh, generic uh, diagnostic platform, which can run different kinds of assays, molecular diagnostic assays, immunoassay, clinical chemistry assays in one instrument. This is actually an example of our COVID-19 molecular diagnostic cartridge. And what is becoming important here is that we see a big drive towards platforms. Because of course, imagine what's happening once COVID-19, the pandemic is over. If you have a system which is sort of only running that specific um, application case, you have a huge infrastructure for manufacturing something, but no demand. So you need a toolbox-like approach with generic building blocks. And I've just shown you a few examples of these generic building blocks, uh, like a sample uptake, um, like uh, membranes for uh, sample prep, so DNA uh, extraction, um, blisters for storing liquid reagents, uh, dry reagents, especially in molecular diagnostics. Um, so it's really, important to have a toolbox of elements which you can com combine and fairly quickly uh, put together for new um, application cases. So um, in conclusion, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that point of care testing is here to stay. And we will for sure, even past COVID-19, we'll see an increasing demand for point of care di uh, diagnostics. Um, and it has really already shown that it really fulfills most of these requirements with regards to speed, ease of use. And as I said, if you look more on the holistic level, also on the cost side. And microfix clearly is the core enabling technology for this, not only for molecular diagnostics, and I've shown here two examples for immunoassays as well. Here is one for an um, P24 antigen-based um, HIV assay. And the, the, the nice thing about here is it actually includes all the sample prep which is the big part. Uh, this is another example of a centrifugal multiplexed immunoassay. So you can actually run more than one sample. So you can see that MicroFreeze really is a very, very nice tool to realize point of care diagnostic systems. And um, I, I hardly dare to say that of course, in times of COVID-19, uh, this field of course gets a big boost from this. So we're actually profiting from this pretty dire situation, which of course puts a lot of strain on, on the lives of many people. Uh, with this, I'm at the end of my presentation. And of course, later on, would be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Thank you very much. OK, thanks, Holger, for the interesting presentation, and in particular, for keeping the timeline perfectly. Um, OK. We are now with the second presentation. So um, simply to keep our timeline, um, we will now move to from the plastic world with integrated diagnostic devices. We are now uh, going to the glass world. And uh, I've been knowing uh, Alexios Tsanis since, oh, ages meanwhile, decades. Um, and, yeah, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> and we are always arguing about the benefits of glass and plastic, and we agree that both materials are needed in microfluidics. And yeah, Alexios, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Claudia, and thank you very much also to Holger for doing the first pitch uh, in point of care. Um, my world's a little bit different. It's not directly in point of care. One of the issues that I was asked to touch on is surface functionalization and their utilization in microfluidics. I hope that everybody see my screen so I can start. Um, Good. So two short words about IMT. We are basically a foundry more than 60 years on the market. We are known to create structures on metals and dielectrics, basically on glass, for optical, electrical and fluidical applications. We usually uh, we utilize uh, automatic pr procedures from the semicon world transferred into the glass world by utilizing semicon equipment uh, that you can see some examples here on my screen. Uh, in the space of life sciences, we are aiming providing a scalable wafer level production of consumables for life science and diagnostic applications. Basically, what we are uh, applications in terms of flow cells, organ on a chip, single cell analysis or cell enrichment or sample prep uh, in, and some other applications. Uh, basically, the glass as a material uh, has found uh, some very nice good niches uh, due to some of its uh, material properties, the bioinertness, chemical, mechanical, and op optical properties, particular where you're doing single cell fluorescence, ma glass material is nearly uh, the best in choice. And of course, the surface properties, the surface properties I'm going to go into a little bit because I'm talking about chemistry. So, and the nice thing is that there's a whole variety of glass available with different, with variations of these properties. So what we are aiming is to provide flexible processes, meaning creating a, as a foundry solutions of the customers by integrating uh, into the microfluidic uh, context uh, different assays and that would be detection of molecules by different means being electrical optical or other so when we're talking about biomolecule detection what we would like to do is to or isolate the analyte that we are looking for or try to bind it get it to stick somewhere in order that we can look at that so uh, there are different uh, ways to do that and of course the most interesting would be to covalently bind it actively on the surface this is somewhere in the middle of my slide in order to be able to look at this specific analyte in order to do that you would like to try to uh, to bring the analyte in this specific position. That means if you're thinking of a microfluidic context, you would like to bring the analyte by doing some changes on its surface. That would mean, for example, to make it reactive, meaning that the analyte would like to stick there. You would like to change the surface weightability uh, by making it in hydrophobic in order to get the water solution to stick to go to the right place. And of course, you would like to ensure that you have a biocompatibility in order that your analyte does not dies on its way to the area of investigation. And of course, you, if you have many of these analytes, you might like to have a structured chemical functionalization in order to get more of those little guys to stick around. There's a whole uh, chemistry uh, available. I'm not going to dwell into that because I'm a microtechnologist. But if we look about what kind of different chemical patterning we could do, one of the most uh, known is the anti-fouling or repelling chemistry, where you're trying to make the uh, analyte to, to guide the analyte by creating areas where it would not like to stick. Classical is a pegulization of uh, the walls. Uh, there are also biocidic uh, uh, coatings, but we are not at least working with those. Another area where uh, 
chemical functionalization uh, is seen is by changing the polarity of, uh, let's call it here, the microfluidic walls by doing coatings. A classical glass is hydrophilic, a classical plastic is hydrophobic, and by doing coatings, you can change that, and that has some advantages in specific applications. And if we are talking about micron or submicron chemical functionalization, what would be trying to do there is to do a structured hydrophilic hydrophobic coating and uh, that I'll try to uh, show you in the next slides and a specific chemical partnering in a glass channel network in order to, uh, to isolate the specific analyte. So one of the classical, very known, it's just a demonstrator, is changing the polarity of the flow cell in order changing it from hydrophobic to hydrophilic or vice versa. And this is the, the classical idea of making oil in, in water or water in oil droplets. And uh, this is something that is well feasible. This is a classical cell encapsulation in a droplet cell that is well demonstrated in the academia and in the industry as well. With a collaboration with uh, Surfix, we demonstrated that we can do a patent functionalization within the microfluidic uh, channel, channel network. Uh, and what the idea is here is that you can basically guide the, co the uh, fluid to occupy specific spaces within the microfluidic. And some of the idea is that you can do there a stop and go structures within the microfluidic uh, uh, chemistry or do a functionalization or and generation of double emulsions that is demonstrated basically here here we have a network of mic of of a double emulsion uh, glass uh, chip where we have the red part of the uh, channel network is hydrophobically coated. This generates, as you can see here, double emul emulsion droplets. And that has a kind of a big advantage. And this is done by selecting uh, the right glass and the right click chemistry, uh, as we demonstrated together with Surfix. So if we go to the next slide. One thing that we would like to do is, of course, if we would like to get more analytes to stick in the area, we would like to have a chemical patterning of the glass. IMT is working with amide or amine or azide chemistry, and we have a couple of scenarios to do that. Usually, it is some kind of speed coating and an optical selective structuring. And in that terms, we can create periodic or non-periodic structures. Basically, what you can see here are uh, the functional coatings with some kind of a fluorescent uh, dye that has stuck to them and doing fluorescent detection. Otherwise, it's a little bit difficult to look at these guys. And a very nice demonstrator of non-structured uh, coating is this one here. It's a label-free detection for drug discovery, basically our customer uh, utilizes uh, waveguides to bring the, uh, the light on the area of investigation that is actually this space here. On this specific area, we have an immobilization chemistry that captures the analyte. The waveguide basically brings the light, the, uh, uh, the chemistry, reduces the uh, intensity of the light and an interferometric detection give us an absolute measurement of the quantity of the analyte within the microfluidic component. So the combination of microfluidics, structured waveguides, and immobilization chemistry enables the solution of uh, our customer. Of course, we could do this structured surface chemistry. Here is an example with amine binding chemistry and a non-binding that's basically a pegylization, if you could like that. Uh, so it's the ability of doing on a wafer a single layer of amine 
surrounded by non-binding chemistry. We have demonstrated that we can do that all the way down to the sub-micrometer level, and that could have some advantages for sequencing applications. Nonetheless, even in the micrometer uh, range, there are uh, very nice applications where you would like to bind specific cells on the um, on the uh, flow cell in order to prefer, perform specific assays. We have also done that with azide. Basically, depending on what you would like to anchor on your flow cell, you might need different uh, binding, um, how we call it, connectors, terminators, and therefore we are trying to provide a more broad platform. This is a good example of where structured organic binding uh, could be utilized, and this is by for NGS flow cells, where basically you are doing sequencing by synthesis, bringing one oligo after the other, doing a fluorescent detection of the specific oligo. And the whole idea is, of course, to have billions and billions of these structured binding dots for the oligonucleotides. And this can be easily performed, uh, using classical microlithography processes. The challenge, of course, is to encapsulate this into a microfluidic context, that meaning after you have some sensitive chemistry on top of your wafer, to put a second wafer with the fluidic channel network and, of course, also some kind of a anti-fouling chemistry, in this case here, a pegylization. In order to demonstrate that this is feasible, we created an assay together with CSEM, uh, where we basically uh, created just a simple glass network. Uh, on the glass dots that we can see, the yellow spots, uh, uh, CSEM and SUSOS put an aminosilane film on top of it. Uh, CSEM did an, oligo, did an oligonucleotide uh, spotting, sent the wafers over to our fab, so it was clean room to clean room transportation. We did our low temperature UV adhesive bond to create the microfluidic components that you see here. Then we laser diced them, sent them back to CSEM to perform an assay. And this work was demonstrated at the last year's Microtas uh, in, in Basel, where we demonstrate basically that the amine chemistry, the oligos, were not damaged by the UV adhesive bond, and we could have a very good stable chemistry and assay even after three months of the process demonstrating that not only we can functionalize a flow cell, but we can also uh, incorporate this functionalization within a microfluidic context. Of course, one of the big challenges is to validate this binding. And the only thing that we currently have as a good solution is uh, doing basically a sci-fi fluorescent detection of the analyte. It's unfortunately a destructive and not a very good idea in the long run. Other uh, uh, possibilities to do quality control of coatings is uh, X-ray, uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy, and of course, contal angle analysis. A very interesting and very critical process of doing coatings in the microfluidics is their res resistance, if you would like, in uh, the assay of the customer. And for example, we have in the NGS, you have uh, chemistries that they, I didn't even know that they existed, that puts very high requirements to the pH of the coating. Additionally, you have also elevated temperatures and long shelf time. So here we have been demonstrating for our azide chemistry, the longevity in different pHs uh, versus a control and a background control in order to be able to say, yes, our specific coating can demonstrate a, a, a that it can survive from a pH of 2 up to pH of 10, for example. Uh, so uh, surface functionalization microfluidics enables 
a variety of assays to be translated into microfluidic context, meaning, for example, creating an environment where you can isolate, isolate specific assays, so it is in, in the area of a sample prep, if you would like, or immobilize your, uh, your analyte in order to investigate it, being that electrically or optically. Uh, we can combine this with complex clock structures, like in the example of multi emulsion droplet generation, or creating nano patterns in order to do uh, next generation sequencing or other high throughput, high throughput multiple assays. And of course, doing that in combination with semiconductor based processes, as we utilize here in EMT. Uh, provide us uh, pathways to uh, good economies of scales of microfluidic solutions. With that, I was even faster than Holger to make my talk. So if there's any questions, I am more than open to take them. Okay, thanks Alexios for keeping perfectly in time. Uh, we have uh, time for a couple of questions here. And uh, I take the opportunity to start uh, directly. Um, you were discussing uh, not only glass fabrication, but also integration of reagents, yeah, making a, a real definite chip device or micro total analysis system happen. Um, the interesting question when we go from the R&D in the real world uh, about cost, if you have an array integrated in your glass slide, take the format of a microscopy slide, which cost categories can you achieve? So if we are talking about, uh, now if we think about the NGS flow set, right? I mean, uh, the, for example, yeah, exactly. uh, this, is, this is an ex ex expensive flow cell, but you have also million or millions of measuring points, right? So basically mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it is what is the price of the data point? And there is, if you're having densities of, let's say, five, 600 nanometers, that you're having a 500 billion, so I do not know how many dots. At the end of the day, you can get a sequencing, a full genome sequencing down to $500 for the end customer. This is the economies of scale that this combined lithography with functionalization facilitates. Now, if we are talking about uh, binding cells on a microscope slide or in a rough channel. This is much more economical because we're using classical lithography. And then we can talk about flow cells going in the few decades of Swiss, of Swiss francs or dollars or euros. That would be 50, 60, 70, depending of course on the volume, right? <laughs> but yeah. it's not forbiddingly expensive to do a good silanization provided you know how to do that. Okay, simply coming back, you, you said 50, 60, 70 dollar, even for mm. flow cell to Holger's uh, entry statement for the point of care, we would, would be much lower, but it's not the one dollar device. So therefore- Never, I'm never. On, uh, academia, no. hands up. It is not a micro- It will never be a one dollar uh, design. I mean, okay. if I see the, 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 the cost of the chemistry, sometimes the flow cell is completely irrelevant to the chemistry okay. utilized, right? So Okay, thanks for this. And uh, yeah, keeping in time. And uh, you mentioned that glass is the most appropriate material. So Holger mentioned plastic, and usually you are with chocolate on any single trade fair. So I'm happy when we meet again and you can come up with the most important material in, once again. Okay. Let's have this fight again, uh, Claudia. More <laughs> than welcome. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for today. Yeah. So, and now we are going to the next presentation uh, from Switzerland to Spain. And Luis Fernandez is uh, going to inform us about bioassays and yeah, coming to the microfluidic scale. Yeah, opportunities and always challenges what you encounter with new devices. Okay, Luis, it's up to you. Uh, here I am. Hello, uh -huh. can you hear me now? 
So hello everybody, I hope you can see my presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Luis Fernandez. I'm the CTO of uh, Microliquid, which is a contract design manuf for manuf manufacturing organization for um, uh, microfluidic solutions. And uh, today I'm going to talk about biosafe transfer to microfluidic scale. What's our strategy on that specific topic, which uh, I hope I will convince you that it's a key part of uh, development of a uh, microfluidic device and uh, what's our strategy and what's our vision on that. So as I think we already talked about that in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, talks. Um, what, uh, what the industry is looking for when they are looking at, um, seeing microfluidics is a way to implement a whole laboratory in a microfluidic device and system in a, in a, in a consumable part. Um, there are many applications uh, for, for this technology, as already mentioned. Um, diagnostics is a big field, immunoassays and with molecular diagnostics, but also cell culture and organ and shape are also integrated into the market really hard. And also in diagnostics, single cell analysis is coming as a new technology or being um, established in the market. Uh, the advantages are already cleared, as already mentioned. Uh, they bring opportunities for automatization of the whole process which is required to be uh, deli or delivered by the, by the products. Uh, it allows you to um, generate portable devices instead of making the whole test in the laboratory. Um, the volume of the reagents that you will require, the, the reducing these volumes is a key part as well, as uh, they are mostly um, very quite expensive reagents which are required in order to uh, perform the tests. And uh, basically what you perform is a one-step diagnostic test, uh, something which can be bring into the user uh, when exactly at the spots where the, where the test is needed instead of moving the sample to a, to a um, control laboratory. Uh, however, there are still issues uh, to be um, solved uh, when you are doing this technology and you need to have a broad uh, technological background in order to solve them. Um, first of all, most of the, at least most of the uh, companies which are coming to us and they're interested in order to bring a market for based product into the market, they, they have always uh, problems regarding with the materials that have been used until now, till then, uh, in order to solve uh, or to develop the, the protocols that they want to bring into the market using microfluidics. That requires the, the change in that specific uh, materials in order to be compatible with microfluidic technology. Uh, the compatibility of these materials uh, with respect to the bioassay is a key part as well. Um, uh, that also generates problems in the manufacturing, how to make mass manufacturing of the final device, which is also coming a problem in order to reduce the costs. And uh, I want to think one of the most important problems is that once you have a protocol which is working in a laboratory, it doesn't have a direct translation into microfluidics. You have to look very into, into detail, the bioassay, how to transfer that currently to microfluidics. And I will uh, talk a bit more about that during this talk. So, but as I mentioned before, so there are many, there are different technology aspects that you need to take into account in order to have uh, the ability to generate uh, a successful microfluidic products. Um, was was uh, with have, microliquid has been working on during the last years has been to establish um, a strong um, biological team in order to be able to bring um, uh, to bring the translate a good translation from the laboratory of the bioassay into the microfluidics world. I will explain a little bit during this talk that later on. But we have been you you also need as I mentioned before to solve other problems such as being able to produce in mass production. Uh, features which are um, in the order of a few microbes. And you need to do that using uh, strategies such as molding, but that requires specific techniques in order to do that, in order to reach uh, this uh, sensitivity and so, so tolerances and resolution in the fabrication uh, processes. Uh, also, as mentioned before, in the previous talks, you will need bonding techniques in order to complete the, the, the products. And that requires, because you will require integration of uh, reagents, that would require you to develop new ways of performing bonding techniques with low temperatures. Um, surface treatment is also an issue, already important, already mentioned by Alexios. Um, 
it's always required, it's, many, it's, it's very often required that you have a specific surface chemistry in order to target, the, well, the bioassay, which is uh, developed one of the one clear examples as well, uh, different from the, uh, the ones uh, presented by Alexius, is droplet microfluidics in single cell analysis, which is really pushing really hard into the market. You really have to ha have a strong expertise on how to, surf, to treat the surface in order to get that done really uh, well. And finally, uh, polymers, um, polymer materials, new ones, uh, which are targeting a specific problems that are uh, brought uh, by the by the bioassay. Um, but as I mentioned before, I will talk a bit, a little bit more about the biological process, how to bring the bioassay into the microfluidic world. So the difficulties when you are doing this kind of uh, translation from the laboratory to the microfluidic world is that you start with something which is quite complicated. So it's, it's our protocols which are time consuming. Uh, there are different steps will need to be performed into the microfluidic worlds and you need to transfer that. Uh, when you are doing that, if you are not doing that right, uh, you will, uh, when you're doing it, you will end up with uh, lowering the sensitivity as you had, you had it in the, in the beginning in your laboratory. There are other issues such as the how to integrate the reagents. Uh, we already covered that. How to store them? Sometimes the micro and the, the macro and the micro scales are completely different. So you have you have a cartridge with some very nice tiny micro channels and chambers, but you still need to fill in into these cartridges uh, liquids in the order of milliliters, which are required in order to perform the assay, and you need to perform that right or to integrate uh, the reagents in different forms in order to make to be stable enough to be um, capable of uh, staying in, in shape during months. Um, so for every case, you need to study that, uh, to study exactly what needs to be developed and to study the case, how to transfer that correctly. Uh, if you do that, the advantages of microfluidics, as I mentioned before, are, are, really, are really big, starting for uh, the, you will be able to perform all the biological processes integrated in a whole in, in the single set without the need of a specific technicians to perform the different uh, different processes. It will allow you to due to the reduce in, in, in size to high uh, to deliver high throughputs and multiplex parallel assays and to perform the the complete um, develop the, the complete uh, assay in a far, in much faster way. So let's move on how do we perform the development of, uh, of products. Uh, so these are the overall structure of how we develop the product for our clients, uh, starting from the product definition and concepts. Uh, that's uh, where um, our clients approach to us with, uh, okay, so that's exactly what I want to do. And I want to use microfluidics in order to get it done. Uh, we work with the, our, our customers in order to perform the feasibility studies and the proof of concepts. Then is when the design and development starts. Um, the, the, the development of the of the product, the starting from the prototyping, uh, it performed that bringing solutions to the specific processes that need to be integrated into the products, being able to uh, master that once developed, integrate that into a single cartridge and finalize with an alpha and beta prototypes. That's where starts the new product introduction phase, and then uh, where uh, all the manufacturing. Um, um, problems are being solved, uh, ending with the manufacturing, uh, bit setting the line, and then bringing the product into the market. The bioassay is within the first two phases. You need to really, the bioassay transfer, you need to really master that from the really beginning. Uh, what we, how we approach that is that you first work with your um, with with our clients with uh, with the bioassay from from the very beginning and they we ask them to transfer all the knowledge to our biological team we set uh, a specific department of uh, for the bioassay development or so that we have a way to talk with them directly so we can completely understand what the bioassay is what exactly needs to be performed uh, we establish that specific protocol inside of our facility so that we can master that and we uh, set it as a bench stop asset. So, okay, so we, you need to completely understand what needs to be done and be able to reproduce that into your, into your facilities. And after that, start producing or developing the microfluidic device if you want to, to, to do it right. Uh, so once we establish the bench stop assay, then 
you start moving the laboratory work into the microfluidic environment, taking into account the changes in physics and chemistry, which is taking into, which are delivered in the microfluidic world, and take that into your advantage so that you don't lose sensitivity into this, into this process. Uh, once you start doing that, you start producing prototypes, which are making proof of concepts of the different thing, of the different processes, which are integrated into the products, and then combine all the different uh, processes into a single prototype, which is will become your product. After that, you will establish what we call the microfluid test bench, which is uh, the final prototype integrating the whole bioassay and then integrated that for, for final validation and move forward toward, towards the new product integration, which is key for, for manufacturability and reducing the, the final cost of the product. So these are um, more or less the, so, um, the most important fields in my opinion uh, the, the, for microfluidics, which require the, the biasay diagnostics of, of course, cell culture, human identification, uh, for every of them, you will need to master a specific protocol, for instance, for diagnostics. Yeah. If you want to perform the transfer of a biasay into microfluidics and diagnostics, you will be able to master to, to, to work with the sample preparation, uh, how to handle the reagent integration, how to handle fluid flow control, how to, to control the different reagents in the right or in the sample um, in the right time, in the, in the right location, and the right flow rate. Um, also, there are specific uh, techniques in, in biological assays which are need, needed to be um, mastered, which are, for instance, DNA amplification or immune assay, which are often used for diagnostics. And finally, you will also be able to master the, the integration of a detection system, uh, how to turn, uh, make it a transducer from what is outside, what, what is the outcome of the protocol into something which can be measured and then delivered as a data. But let's take a look on the, on first two, so the sample preparation, a little bit deeper, sample preparation and reagent integration, uh, which is what I have time for uh, today. Um, so sample preparation, so it's a key part of the protocol in order to integrate the sample right and to get it ready to perform the bioassay. And there is a broad knowledge on that. I mean, there are so many different uh, sample natures which are, need to be taken into account differently. It's not the same that you have a blood a blood sample or a urine sample, it's a water, uh, it could be liquid biopsy, it's completely different. And for that, you will need to master exactly what are the, the right strategy to concentrate or um, isolate and concentrate exactly what you require. Because from the sample that you have, there are specific analytes of interest, which are you really interested on in order to bring into the further steps in order to perform the, the biological assay. So you need to identify which are the analytes that need to be uh, isolated and concentrated from your sample be, and being able to catch them and to completely wash them in order to carry on with the next, um, with the next protocols. Um, there are ways, different ways of doing it. I will just highlight a couple of them. Um, one is the use of magnetic bits which have been around the microfluidics for, for a long time. And they are starting to bring very nice solutions. The, the advantage of using uh, magnetic bits is that it, once uh, functionalized, it allows you to further increase even the surface to volume ratio. So your sample is really in contact with, has a very high chance in order to contact with specific antibodies or um, a chemical um, functionalizations in order to just uh, select the right analyte or the right molecules that are of interest. And then by using magnetic fields, which could be as simple as using a, a, a magnet. Uh, you could just concentrate that in a specific chamber, then perform washing steps, and finally, and finally get just the isolation and the concentration ready uh, at a very cost-effective uh, way. A different way are uh, membrane filters. Uh, for instance, for whole, uh, for blood, the use of membranes that can allow you also to remove the, whole, the cells which are not required if you require the, the use of plasma or, or serum. And the other topic, which I think it's, is quite important in biocide translation is the, the, the reagent integration. Um, what, well, while performing a bioassay, you will require different reagents, that different volumes that need to be taken into, to be placed at different locations at the right times, but need to be integrated within the cartridge in order to reduce the level of complexity of the point of care system. Uh, that means that you need to deal with 
vol different volumes, you need to be with the stability of these reagents, how to mix them, get rid of bubbles, and how to integrate that into the final degree device is a key topic. There are three different ways of, uh, or ma mainly three different ways in our opinion to do that. One is spotting, has been already uh, touched a little bit, um, not using photolithography, but you can also use is um, a spotting. Spotting is mainly what you have, it's a certain kind of needle, which allows you to, de to deposit uh, tiny droplets at specific locations. Could You could just have locations of, uh, of droplets in the order of uh, 100 micrometers in diameter with different, different rates at different locations. And finally, integrates these uh, biological uh, components so that you can bring a microarray or immunoassay really rapidly and then locate in different, different uh, targets at different locations. That's a very cost-effective way of introducing an immunoassay in my device. Another one uh, is the integration of liquids. So instead of using uh, just surfaces treatment in order to make the insulation or the final tra uh, transducer, uh, you will require integration of liquids as we mentioned before in order to perform your assay. Uh, blisters are small cavities where you integrate the liquids and which can be pushed and then releases the, the liquid into the microfluid device in a very robust way in order to be available during the virus. And the final one is the lyophilization a process in which what you do is to establish um, a powder-based substance uh, integrated into the into the cartridge, which will be available during the biosay by introducing the right uh, volume and the right uh, liquid um, and putting it back into the into the um, into the way which will be used into the biosay protocol. The, the reason why using this strategy is that because many different reagents are not stable enough in a liquid form and they will be required to be lyophilized in order to be ready and stable during weeks and months of time uh, and then reconstituted into the cartridge and then being exactly at the liquid form right at the time that they are required into the biosay. So I hope that I um, convince you a little bit or bring you a little bit our strategy and vision on how to be to do the biosay uh, translation into microfluidics uh, in order to, and I, I just want to say as a final, as a final conclusion is that if you want to do it right, I'm, you need not only the facilities in order to generate microfluidic devices, but you will be also needing the facilities in order to integrate the bioassay into your into your into your organization, master that, and make the advantages of both worlds, the bio worlds and the microfluidic worlds, to translate that efficiently. And cost and in a cost effective effective uh, way and with that i will finish my presentation and i will be open for questions if any okay thanks Luis, for the nice introduction on the topics micro liquid is covering back again here um yeah, there's time for a single question, and um, I would like to ask something similar. Uh, Alexios get got simply on uh, co coming on the topic. We would like to earn money in the future. Cost if you have a rather, let me say, easy device with some blisters. Let me say two blisters and a microfluidic structure. Can you give a cost estimate? Well, if you. That's, uh, that's a very hard question in terms of, if you have a couple of blisters and then a channel, how much does it cost? Uh, chip two blisters and give, give that, I, I simply want to drive um, the um, yeah, group here from the idea microfluidics as a $1 business when you have um, some more complexity involved. Well, it it's, will never be $1 when you are integrating blisters already because, well, blisters are not, cheap even uh, by themselves. And so, um, so it will be always in the terms of few euros. I think we already touched this, this subject. I, I completely agree. It, we, it will be very difficult to get really passive uh, microfluidic components which got targets the $1 market. Okay. And, and for sure this, this is, well, something that needs to be uh, continued to develop uh, during the course of the years. Okay. Thanks a lot. I simply would like to uh, stress this realistic point uh, of microfluidics. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Thanks to this. Once again, yep. perfectly in time. Um, and now we are changing from 
the complete uh, microfluidic device to moving little uh, little components and addressing the liquid handling point uh, coming from Spain back to Germany. Anne-Marie Oesterle is going to tell us uh, what uh, piezo uh, ceramics uh, is going to do in the automated liquid handling. Yeah, please take over. Yes, hello, thank you. So first I'm starting here the video that you also can see me in person. And I hope you can see my screen and hear me. I hope everything's working. So um, yeah, hello and thanks for organizing this um, nice session here and for the possibility to speak here um, within yeah, the topic of microfluidics. Um, my name is Anna-Maria Oesterle and I'm the segment marketing manager for medical technology and the, the company PI Ceramic. So PI Ceramic belongs to the company group of PI, Physik Instrumente. And um, <clears throat> we at PI Ceramic, we are the uh, competence field, the competence center for all things about piezo. And um, yeah, as the title of my uh, talk already shows, um, I will yeah present today an insight about the handling of little amounts of liquids with the help of piezo technology. So yeah, as all the previous speakers has already said, COVID-19 has of course a big influence on all the business um, round about microfluidics and in vitro diagnostics. Of course, we know there is a huge demand for microfluidic de devices and in vitro diagnostic for testing of COVID-19. But as the first speaker has already shown, Mr. Becker, um, there is a lot of interest around in vitro diagnostics and microfluidics also before COVID-19. And I think we can all be sure that this will continue on a quite high level also, um, yeah, with a little bit distance to this um, pandemic. So I want to speak about the application and the enabling function of piezo technology for microfluidics, which is included in most of or can be included in many in vitro diagnostic devices and technologies. So when we take a look on the liquid handling function, which can be implemented by piezo um, components or piezo actuators, you can see a short overview here about um, different functions that can be implemented and enabled by the help of piezos. So starting at the left side, um, piezo technology can enhance and enable shock-free dosing of very small amounts of liquid, for example, in microfluidic chips with very, very tiny um, liquid channels or chambers to move the liquids quite smooth back and forward or to yeah, bring them going through the microfluidic chip. Using piezo technology is a very known and important application for droplet generation. We already have seen to, to the presentation of previous speakers that this can be done by special surface functionalization and microfluidic chips, but of course by um, yeah moving parts within um, microfluidic devices or dispensing systems, droplets can be generated in a very, very precise way. Of course, mixing is also a very important topic in microfluidic uh, devices, as well as sorting. Sorting can be used in the field of cytometry, um, cell sorting, and here very precise and especially fast and dynamic operation is very important to have a high throughput. And last but not least, of course, sample loses or sample preparation can be supported by the use of piezo technology. So today I only want to focus on three of these topics just to give you an idea what, what is the, the impact of piezo technology, where can it be used and what are uh, yeah, the direct functions of piezos um, inside microfluidic or point of care or uh, in vitro diagnostic devices. So starting with uh, the function of droplet generation, um, yeah, as I said, we have seen this can be uh, done by surface functionalization within microfluidic chips, 
but we have also seen that array spotting is very important to generate tiny arrays, for example, immuno arrays in microfluidic chips and devices. But array spotting is also used to um, yeah, manufacture test consumables, like test stripes with very small areas um, of reagent droplets for the reaction and detecting different kinds of diseases. So um, array spotting or general droplet generation can be done with piezo technology quite good and is quite known for uh, a long time um, by the so-called inkjet principle, which many of you might know from yeah, general printing techniques. And this can also be used in the biotechnology and medical environment, as you can see on the left scheme here. So how is this inkjet principle working? We can see um, a tube, a liquid channel, um, a capillary, whatever is used in uh, devices like this. And you can see a so-called piston directly in contact with this liquid channel. And if the piston is moving, it's pressing on top of the um, capillary or um, tube and then pressing a droplet out of this channel. So here in this scheme, we can say the piston could be a piezo actuator with a headpiece or whatever, moving very precise and very fast um, back and forward. So what a piezo actuator is doing here is not pressing the entire liquid channel or capillary together. It's just bringing um, a short pressure pulse to this, um, for example, glass capillary so that a droplet is falling out. So of course, depending on the used tubes or capillaries, their diameter and the nozzle size and so on, it's possible by these technology to generate tiny droplets down to a picoliter volume. And as I said, it's possible to do this extremely fast with repeatable quality. And of course, it's possible to dose and dispense fluids with very different viscosities. So it's possible to use the inkjet principle for extra solutions, but it's also possible to use it for highly viscous media, polymers, or for example, solutions containing living cells. So on the right side, you can see just an example where these um, array spotting can be used. Here, this is an example of just some parts of a PCR process where tiny droplets are um, dispensed in an array shaped and then yeah, um, a cell suspension is used and an RT mix is dispensed on top of very tiny droplets again and again. So here, the generation of these really, really precise droplets is key. What can piezo technology do here or what kind of piezos are used? So you can see the two pictures, piezo actuators on the left side doing a very yeah, dynamic and precise um, motion. And on the other side, it's also possible to use piezo components, as I said, like tubes, because for the inkjet principle, it's possible that um, glass capillaries are just brought through the inner diameter of a glass uh, of a piezo tube. I said they're working very dynamic. So with the help of piezo technology, it's possible to um, use operating frequencies up to three kilohertz. So very, very high repeating rates to generate yeah, huge amounts of um, tiny droplets for these processes. And of course, it's possible by the help of piezo actuators to, to do this with quite low driving voltages. So using our multi-layer actuator, it's possible um, to, to be in the range of 100 volts and also smaller. So it's a quite a low, low driving voltage. And of course, depending on the tubes or um, capillaries used, we are able to support with piezos using different shapes, sizes, and of course, electrode structure to enable the precise dosing here. But not only array spotting or droplet dispensing can be used in uh, the field of microfluidics and EVD. As I said, um, sorting tasks are yeah very challenging tasks when it comes to molecular diagnostics, um, because yeah, a whole blood sample contains 
different kinds of cells which can be analyzed and which can be sorted. So um, cytometry cell sorting is a process which can be enabled by the use of piezo technology. Of course, there are different methods how this can be done in flow cytometry using charges to um, guide cells to yeah, different sorting channels. But I want to show here um, how this can be done by actuators, by actuation and um, by uh, yeah, the manipulation of cells in these microfluidic channels. So let's take a look to this scheme here of uh, cell sorting or particle sorting and how it can be done by the help of actuators. We can see here um, the central um, fluid channel here containing cells or particles of different characteristics. They are analyzed here in the or they are analyzed here before the, the next step. So deciding which is the particle or cell that has to be sorted in a certain kind of liquid channel. And we see here that there are three different kinds of channels where the particles or cell can be sorted. So the sorting process itself is executed here in this area. So before the splitting in the three channels, and we can see here on the right side how this can be done with um, piezo actuators. So here in this kind of uh, round piezo actuators glued on top of these liquid chamber here, and by applying a voltage, the actuator is doing a bending motion, and therefore it's manipulating um, the the liquid interface inside these um, yeah cell sorting device. So by expanding the actuator here the liquids are influenced here and they yeah give like a shock or a pressure pulse to the cells here so that they kick them um, to one or the other channels in the sorting device. So this is how piezo actuator could um, help sorting cells, especially multi-layer actuators could be used here as we see on the slide. Again, this very dynamic operation is very useful here. So it's possible to sort millions of cells or billions of cells in one hour uh, using these multi-layer actuators with their very low driving voltage. And um, yeah, they are mostly um, inserted or uh, yeah, designed very deep inside these um, cytometry devices, which are placed mostly in a lab, big devices. And so they have a very whole a high lifetime, these actuators, and um, working very um, reliable in these yeah, big and high tech cell sorting devices over a very long time. So coming to the last application uh, where present technology can help in the field of microfluidics and in vitro diagnostics. We also have heard it in uh, a previous presentation here, sample preparation is a very important topic uh, in, in, in vitro diagnostic because it's yeah quite an advantage to have a fast and seamless execution of this sample preparation. And of course, it should be contamination free. So best way would be to have the sample preparation directly in the microfluidic in vitro diagnostic device. And here ultrasound can be um, yeah, one enabling technology to have these um, yeah, integrated sample preparation in the uh, in vitro diagnostic device. How can this be done? By the help of power ultrasound, because power ultrasound is able to break up cellular structures, for example, to break up the cell wall of cells so that the inner parts of a cell can be released, for example, in a blood sample in the in vitro diagnostic device when inner parts of the cell have to be analyzed, like, for example, DNA. Um, let's take a, have a look to the scheme here, which shows again the characteristics of ultrasound, just to make it clear for you what's going on there. So we can see um, these ultrasonic waves here uh, in the scheme. And 
here is a picture of tiny particles that show how ultrasound is propagating in the media, for example, air or a liquid. And we can see that here are these so-called compression zones and here rarefraction zones. So we see a higher density and a lower density of particles or yeah, media um, when ultrasonic waves are tra traveling through the media. So these compression and refraction zones lead to um, like a bursting of uh, material. Uh, in this application, it's the, the bursting and the blasting of, for example, the cell wall for cell loses. So what can be done with the help of ultrasound or which piezos are suitable for applications like this? So it's possible to um, build up ultrasonic transducers, as you can see on the upper right hand side. Um, here we are able to support by building subassemblies containing of piezo elements, which are also contacted or assembled in terms of soldering or gluing. And here we are able to support with, um, yeah, contact like with flex, flexible circuits, which are very um, compact and flexible in, for example, point of care devices with only a very small building space. So the range is going from piezo components to assembled um, yeah, elements up to um, yeah, transducers, which can be integrated in these in vitro diagnostic devices. So, as I said in the slides before, the core competence of PI Ceramics, so uh, the Piezo Technology Competence Center of PI, is here um, that we can support with Piezo components, customized Piezo components, with transducer manufacturing, of course, value added designs. And when it comes to the development phase, we are able to um, yeah, manufacture also very flexible quantities, going from one single piece sometimes to quantities of several millions. And to meet the demands of the medical technology um, device industry, we also have um, more than enough clean room environment for the production of these piezo elements or sub-assemblies there. Um, of course, PI is not only working in the field of microfluidics or supporting microfluidics and in vitro diagnostic devices. We also um, yeah, support technologies in the medical field like minimally invasive devices, medical implants, and of course, other emergent technologies like therapeutic ultrasound. So if you have any questions to this topic, of course, again here, um, directly in the session or to contact me uh, via the matchmaking tool. But SPI is present uh, worldwide in the US and Europe and in uh, Asia. Of course, you always can feel free to contact the co colleagues from PI. And therefore, I will yeah, thank you for your attention. And um, if there are any questions, I'm open for this now. OK. Thanks, Anne-Marie, for this interesting presentation on what you can do with uh, piezo materials. And also, once again, for keeping in time, there's um, time for a short question, um, or maybe two. Um, I have the question on my table. Um, your, when you were talking about the uh, liquid dosing, small amounts of liquids um, actuated by your, your piezo actuator, um, you also need the, um, the nozzle or the capillary for dosing. How far are you going in the integration? Because I saw rather complex devices beyond the ceramic material. Uh, what are you offering in, in complexity? So, as I said, we are the experts for the piezo technology. So. Mm -hmm. Basically, we are offering the piezos. Um, of course, we are not doing glass, but in general, or polymers like used um, tubes or capillaries. But as I said, we have a very strong capability and expertise when it comes to assembling technology. So we are able in general to offer the service to glue or solder our piezo elements with certain other elements. So if this is needed in general, we can offer and of course talk about further support to do a higher integration 
for example, gluing a piezo uh, on top of a glass capillary. In general, we have the assembling technology and we would be uh, willing to support further than just doing the piezo. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, with this, uh, we will move to the next presentation. Um, now we were with the material uh, and in Germany, and now we move to um, the pump, a little bit more integration and uh, going through Great Britain and uh, learning about pumps, uh, microfluidic handling, and in particular, pulsation-free handling of microliquid, what is an extremely fascinating topic. Okay, John, let hey. me hear and let us hear about the news, what you achieved last year. Can everyone hear me okay? Can you hear me, Claudia? Yeah. Good, right, I shall uh, share my screen. Okay, hopefully everybody can see my screen now. So, um, Let me just try and share again. I had this problem the other day. Right. Oh, it's not moving on. Okay, I've, I've got it to sort of... Apologies. It's not... So I'm having having a few problems trying to move the screen on. So I do do apologise. I'm so sorry, this is not uh, sharing properly. Right, okay. Hang on, I think I'll just stop and start again. Do apologize for this. Yeah, John, maybe it's an option if you uh, don't move to the uh, complete screen presentation mode um, and simply show the screens. Sometimes if you have more than one monitor, this is... Yeah, I have multiple monitors. It's not picking up the uh, the right, the right yeah. part of the system. So, right, uh, let's see if it works now. Right, hopefully you can see the screen and hopefully this will move on. No, I can't get this, the presentation to move on. I do apologize. Um, John, uh, simply, uh, you can do two things. Either send me the presentation and I will move through. Um, and you can uh, simply um, move from the presentation mode and go through the, the normal PowerPoint. That usually helps. Yeah, it's quite a big presentation, so it might yeah. struggle yeah. to... Right, hang on, let's, let's see if this works. No, it's still not working. I do apologize, everybody. Um, simply move there. Can you move the slide there? Um, no, it's... It doesn't even seem to be showing up on my screen now. Let's try that one. Okay. Uh, uh, right. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. 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 Second slide. 
Right. Okay. So, uh, you know, apologies for the uh, the bit of the stuttered start, everybody, and thanks for bearing with me. Um, yeah, uh, these things are great when they work and, and frustrating when they don't. This will teach me for having multiple screens and it, it not sharing properly. But um, anyway, so uh, yeah, thank you everybody for joining me today. Um, I'll, I'll try and rush through this a little bit because I know I've wasted some time. So um, why is this pump the sort of next evolutionary step in microfluidic control? Well, um, for me, uh, the answer to this is pr pretty simple. It's because the, the TTP disc pump is, is pretty well aligned to the current industry trends. And from what we hear, the, the sort of trends in the microfluidic industry is currently undergoing a similar uh, development to the electronics industry some sort of 60 years ago, where the sort of big trends there were, were sort of miniaturization and functional integration. Um, and if we sort of take the diagnostics industry, for example, um, you know, as, as highlighted in a number of um, sort of talks previously, um, you know, a large proportion of di diagnostics testing is moving out of central laboratories um, and into the doctor's surgery and increasingly the home, you know, hence for the need for, for sort of miniaturization. And this is really being driven by consumers um, who are demanding more control over their healthcare and a healthcare service that is delivered at point of care and in real time. Uh, say, a, a doctor's uh, appointment, for example. Um, however, to achieve this uh, demand for real-time diagnosis, you need a rapid readout, and microfluidics can help improve what's called the sample turnaround time, or commonly referred to as the STAT. Um, and, you know, there's a big drive to sort of, you know, reduce the, the time to, uh, to read out, as, as highlighted previously. Um, putting the above into context for a moment, you know, how many of us sort of now wear something like this, which is a, an activity tracker. Um, you know, personally, I wear a, a Fitbit or as my uh, other half calls it, my fat bit, because I've not lost any weight since owning the device. But, you know, this, this gives um, a readout on my heart rate, my calories burned, my sleep patterns. And this even gives an estimate of my uh, VO2 max score, which gives me a level of fitness for my, uh, for my age, um, which I hasten to add is not too great because I have a love of cheese. But, you know, that aside, in essence, it's, it's you and I who are helping to fuel this revolution towards uh, sort of compact and, and real-time diagnosis. So, okay, um, from this example, we know there's a trend towards miniaturization and improved stats or sample turnaround times. And, and we, we, we understand that, you know, microfluidics really holds the key to a lot of this. So, okay, you know, how does all this play out for disc pump? Well, uh, the table shown here um, sort of breaks out the advantages and disadvantages of some of the typical microfluidic pumps used today. Um, you know, if you sort of look down some of the sort of uh, columns, you'll note that the immediate takeaway from this is that pressure driven flow offers many benefits over the other technologies. However, as it is typically requires uh, an air pump, um, sometimes an accumulator to take out pulsation of, from that air pump, uh, you know, a little pressure controller and, and some other uh, ancillary parts, its, its current physical size and the system complexity doesn't really lend itself very well to, to miniaturization. Well, you know, that is until this pump came along. Um, you know, this pump radically simplifies the whole pressure driven flow setup. And as you can see, you know, you go from a very large setup to something that can sit in the palm of your hand. You know, this pump weighs just about five grams in weight. It has a volume of about seven centimeters cubed. Um, and we have a, a new version out um, in sort of Q1 of next year that's going to be even smaller than that, uh, that was designed for a wearable medical device. Um, so, you know, this pump really does support the trend for miniaturization, and it can really help enable the next generation of compact, uh, compact microfluidic devices, um, such as, you know, point of care diagnostics, for instance. Okay, so you know, miniaturization is one aspect, but you know what else does does this pump have to offer to microfluidics? Well, uh, to start with, um, high precision flow control, which is absolute paramount. Um, you know, this this pump offers excellent regulation of, of pressure and vacuum, which in turn drives very accurate and stable, precise liquid flow. So this makes it possible to achieve incredible accuracy across a really wide performance range. And if you look at the, the sort of the two things presented here on the left, there is a, a typical sort of disc pump setup. And you can see disc pump compared to a, a couple of two euro coins there, just to give you some idea of the size. Um, and, and from this, you can see that, um, you know, we've held very, very stable, precise flow across four orders of magnitude 
with a very, very quick response time between um, sort of the step changes that have been asked to, uh, to, uh, to sort of follow here. So, you know, this leads me on to the other um, important feature, which is response speed. Um, being a piezo technology, uh, disk pump has very little inertia. So we can go from zero to maximum performance in under a millisecond. So this enables sort of rapid response to set point changes as demonstrated on the previous slide. And this is really good because it enables pressure gradients to be very, very accurately followed and repeatedly followed in, in microfluidic circuits. And this is great because it can help reduce things like bubble formation, bubble entrainment, and it can also reduce waste uh, because it means that it can react to a set point change quickly the system will stabilize before we've put too much uh, expensive reagent down the drain. Um, if you look at this compared with syringe pumps, for example, um, by design, they have very high inertia and therefore they're slow to respond to set point changes, you know, as, as seen here in this graph. Um, you know, I think in this example, we were about 50 times faster than a syringe pump, for instance. Uh, the next important feature is, is flow rate stability. Um, due to the principle of operation, like I say, piezo, um, our pump operates at around 21,000 cycles per second. And in each cycle, we move just a few nanoliters of air. So the result in the airflow is, is, effect, you know, is ultra smooth. You know, we say effectively pulsation free. And this can really help improve measurement sensitivity and flow rate accuracy. And this is shown by the very stable trace uh, to the right um, compared with the syringe pump. Um, as mentioned previously, syringe pumps suffer from high inertia. Um, and therefore slow response speeds, but they also have mechanical play issues to do with stepper motors and lead screws. So you know, their flow rate stability can be affected as a result. Um, as mentioned previously, this pump um, moves just a few nanoliters of air per cycle. We cycle at 21,000 times per second. Um, so like I say, that result in airflow is effectively pulsation free. And this is a really good feature when it comes to handling liquids, because it means you can drive very smooth laminar flow streams. Um, and this is important because it allows liquids to mix via diffusion rather than turbulence. And turbulence, as you can see, is a very chaotic process. And you know, if you try and mix anything via uh, turbulent flow streams, trying to get any kind of repeatability batch to batch is nigh impossible. But with laminar flow, you get very, very repeatable results. Um, in this example uh, shown here, we took a, a gradient chip from our, our good friends at Microfluidic Chip Shop, uh, and we mixed uh, red, yellow, and blue fluids in, in laminar flow streams to create um, a very stable um, spread of colors and uh, create this beautiful rainbow effect. Um, as you can see in the, uh, the sort of expanded image on the left, you can see how those fluids are moving side by side in, in laminar flow streams, mixing via diffusion rather than turbulence. So as those laminar flow streams progress through the gradient chip, they slowly start to blend. And that gives us a really beautiful array of colors that you can see on the far right there, um, you know, which we term the rainbow. Um, this effect was was actually so good, we ended up using it as a marketing piece to uh, to tie in with supporting the National Health Service in the UK, who, who just happened to choose a rainbow as a symbol of hope during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, this is what we posted up on, on LinkedIn. Um, some of you may have seen this even, but, you know, this got a uh, sort of tremendous response, you know, a lot of likes and a lot of really positive comments. And I think one person even even commented, you know, this really demonstrates the beauty of microfluidics, which I thought was a nice thing to say at the time. So, okay, you know, um, this pump offers a compact solution, um, excellent flow control and rapid response, uh, as well as ultra smooth flow. But, you know, what, what else does it bring to microfluidics and, and the array of products that can be developed around that? Well, um, one important factor is, is actual cost. Um, one customer told me that a 150 pound disc pump system that he put together outperformed a 15,000 pound pressure driven flow system he'd purchased to prove original principle in his microfluidic system. Um, the company I'm talking about here were developing a, a compact point of care diagnostic system for COVID-19. And disc pump turned out to be the, the ideal solution for their flow control needs. And they're now looking at integrating three pumps per device. Um, and it, even with three pumps, it offers an improved solution and still a very economical solution for them compared with say alternative to, te alternative to technologies that, that are out there. Um, another important aspect is silent operation. Um, disc pump runs at frequencies above the range of human hearing and as such is 
completely silent. Um, so yeah, this is very much like the icing on the cake for many system uh, producers as noise pollution is always an issue. Um, certainly in point and care diagnostic systems that might have to sort of sit on a doctor's desk in a, in a surgery, for instance. So having touched on what this pump can bring to microfluidics and point of care diagnostics, you know, what can this sort of really enable? Well, if we take um, droplet digital microfluidics as an example, uh, traditionally droplets are formed by uh, bulky pressure driven flow or syringe pump driven systems. And this pump really changes all this through its compact size. As you can see up in the, uh, the top right corner, we've got two little disc pumps connected to some pressure reservoirs and some flow sensors. And we're feeding those through a, a droplet generator chip to create the, you know, the very, very stable droplets as you can see in the left-hand corner. So this means that in theory, um, you know, it's possible to achieve faster processing techniques and, and say, uh, take droplet digital PCR could be applied to point of care diagnostics, for example. Um, also with droplet digital, as you're dealing with um, such small volumes, it's possible to reduce or speed up the number of steps in a process. And this can help improve the sample turnaround time or STAT, uh, which is another very, very important aspect if you're thinking of point of care diagnostics and trying to deliver a result in, say, a 15 minute doctor's uh, appointment. So all of these um, add up so you know as you're dealing in the sort of nano and pico uh, scale um, reagent use is also lower so the cost per test can be reduced um, which is another important factor you know i think i've heard it mentioned numerous times today you know where are we going to get to in terms of cost per test and you know the one dollar test is like the holy grail but you know um, yeah, anything we can do to get closer to that is is obviously a benefit um, and obviously finally um, with droplet biology enabled by this pump, it's possible to have very good control over the individual droplets. Um, so this really can help improve the overall process control and uh, precision. So in this example, um, uh, here's you know, an example of basically droplet biology enabled by this pump. Um, here, the customer was transfecting cells, which is where cells in droplets are exposed to a, an electric field to deliver mole molecules such as DNA or proteins from inside them. Um, so speaking with this customer um, as to why they chose this pump for, for their particular application, you know, they cited the following. Obviously, um, compact size, um, you know, they said it was very easy to stack the pumps. In their particular system, they were using four pumps, as you can see here in the middle. So they, it was a really compact little solution for them to achieve the, uh, the flow setup required. Um, response time, um, as mentioned, that's you know, particularly important. It can help reduce waste um, because the pump will settle to the desired uh, or deliver the desired flow very, very rapidly. Um, another feature that I've not touched on thus far is the fact that um, this pump can be either used for vacuum or pressure, uh, and you can achieve the same level of control uh, in both. So uh, being able to achieve positive and negative pressure can enable people to move fluids backwards and forwards just by adding some valves to the system. Um, one that touched on before, typically pressure driven flow systems need some kind of external pump. Basically, this pump just does it all in one. So, you know, no external pressure source needed. You can remove a, a large element from the system. You can reduce, re, um, reduce system complexity, reduce cost and reduce noise. Um, pressure modulation capabilities as highlighted, highlighted on some previous slides, just how well this pump could respond to the set point changes and hold those changes very, very accurately with, with mean, minimal deviation. And finally was price. Um, like I say, this system had four pumps inside. So, you know, when you're thinking of uh, a disc pump system compared with alternative technologies, it represented a very, very economical option for them. So the attributes of disc pump uh, I've gone through, but we, we bring many advantages to a lot of different segments. Um, one of these being organ on a chip. Um, and the whisper on the street is that this sector is seeing significant investment from the drug and pharma boys as the cost of drug development is rising fast and, and they see organ on a chip as a, a way of potentially helping to speed up the drug discovery process and reduce the costs associated with this. So as such, you know, this pump can offer very, very accurate control, ultra smooth flow. And this I'm told helps to limit the stress on cells and, and bit by bit, we're making very, very good inroads in this market. Um, and, you know, TTP is now, 
um, a member of the organ on the chip te um, technologies network and we're working with a number of customers in this, in this area now. Uh, one area or customer we're working with is actually our sister division, uh, TTP. Um, and here is a prototype of their new cell pod system that's currently being developed um, for the culture of complex cell models. Uh, here they have developed a, what they call a smart plate system for flexible uh, and fully automated fluid handling. So in essence, what they're doing, they're reinventing uh, liquid handling robots, but in a smaller, cheaper and easier to use format um, that can be used for all types of bio research and development work, uh, be that molecular or, or cell based. Um, so the idea here is to do everything that a classic liquid handling robot can do um, from, say, the likes of Hamilton and, and those boys, but in a fraction of the cost, um, a fraction of the size and a fraction of the complexity. So. Um, you know, once again, as you can see, this pump enables the drive towards miniaturization and uh, system integration. Another area we're actively involved in is uh, sample preparation. Um, uh, as mentioned previously, this pump can offer very accurate uh, vacuum and pressure control. And we're currently working with Festo and looking to combine this pump with their VTOE dispense head. Um, the flow diagram uh, presented here is lifted directly from their LifeTech brochure, um, and it just shows how their components can be linked together for various pipetting and uh, dispensing applications. Um, you know, Festo too recognised the drive for more compact solutions with improved system architecture, and you know, as such, they're looking at this pump as a solution here because you know it, it essentially a very compact and simple solution with the added benefits of improved control. Uh, improve noise and cost. Um, you know, Festo is is not the only uh, sort of uh, company that's that's recognising the benefits of our technology. Um, a recent collaboration with Sincerian uh, to show off their new uh, SLF3X flow sensor has resulted in a significant number of inquiries from customers. Um, you know, pretty much looking to mirror the uh, the prototype microfluidic setup that we uh, that we demonstrated, and and you know this has been sort of posted on our, our website and on LinkedIn, and it's it's really received uh, uh, a lot of um, sort of positive comments and and generated a lot of interest as mentioned. So okay, you know we we've got some good products now, but but where do we go? Where do we go forward? Well. Um, you know, in reality, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of your pump and I would love to hear more, but you're already one minute about ahead of time. Uh, OK, well, I'll, I'll wrap up very quickly. I do apologize for the stuttered start, but um, now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. OK, so, um, yeah, we basically developed a, a new high pressure pump that we're looking to launch shortly. Um, and, you know, in, in summary, you know, we, we meet all the trends for microfluidics by, you know, these various aspects here. So apologies for the stuttered start um, and that you can't take any questions, but please feel free to contact me afterwards. And uh, in future, I'll learn to work out how to uh, you know, run with two screens. So apologies again. Okay, yeah. Thanks, uh, John, for this wonderful presentation and the news what happened uh, over one year development work with your pump, um, as said, in favor of this device. And now we are going to learn uh, more about another pumping system uh, from Bartels Microtech. Um, yeah, back in Germany. Um, and there, Florian Simroth is going to tell us uh, how we use these pumps to actively drive microfluidic uh, volumes on a microfluidic chip with a nice pump. Yeah, get started now. Thank you, Claudia. Um, is my audio connection good? I think my internet connection seems to be not that stable. Yeah, get started. Um, but I will try. Yeah. Okay. Um, you should see my screen now. Can you see my presentation? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Florian Simroth and I'm one of the product managers at um, I'm glad to tell you a bit about um, um, latest, latest experiments and um, developments that we are doing um, in our house, especially in cooperation with our friends from Microfluid Chip Shops in Syria and Janspeed. Um, my goal for today is to tell you a bit about um, 
why is it reasonable to combine a micro pump with a microfluidic chip and how can we do that? Um, at first, I would like to introduce Bartos Microtechnik. Um, Bartos Microtechnik was founded in 1969 by our CEO, Frank Bartels in Dortmund. Um, we were one of the world's largest series manufacturer and um, market leader of pizza membrane micropumps regarding liquids and gases. And we are the, one of the top leaders of development services in microfluidics. Um, that leads us to the two business, business sec segments that we are divided in. Um, it's on the one hand, the microengineering section that deals with um, all the um, microfluidics in general, and um, especially in uh, integrating our micropump into um, customers' applications and products. And on the other hand, the micro component section that uh, cares about the heart of, uh, of the company, the MP6, and all the accessories around it. Um, a short roadmap for today. Um, at first, I would like to share our motivation and, and the background why we think that um, combining our micro pump with the micro flick chips is reasonable, necessary, and should have a big impact in the near future. Then we will have a a quick look at uh, theories in microfluidics uh, and uh, fluid dynamics and about and um, have a look at specifications of the micro pump. Afterwards, we have a, a um, look at some implications that we have already um, done in our laboratories. And in the end, I will point out some innovations and um, give you a, a quick summary of the of today's of the today's lecture. Um, but at first, I would like to play a uh, quick um, intellectual game with you. Um, um, when we decided to uh, give that lecture in January, um, the whole COVID-19 situation wasn't real at that point, actually. So, but we already had, had, had that in our minds that um, combining micro pumps with microfluidic ships should be, um, should, should have an impact, should be, um, and it's necessary to, to bring that to the, um, to the, uh, point of care uh, the diagnostics, for example. And that idea was definitely boosted by uh, within the last, last few months um, you know, by the COVID-19 situation. Um, normally, Compromate and Medica takes place in uh, Düsseldorf, which is the capital of North rhine westphalia uh, a state in, in Germany. Um, the, um, that state has got an, a, a, the, the number of citizens of uh, 18 million people. Um, uh, and we were faced um, with 200,000 uh, infections since March. Uh, but we have only 14 um, officially signed laboratories dealing with these high numbers, especially in the last few weeks, we had 5,000 infections um, um, uh, and only 14 officially signed um, laboratories were, were, um, had, to, had, to deal, had to deal with that. And my suggestion or my propose, proposal is, um, we have 6,000 general practitioners in uh, Northern Westphalia. Why don't we equip uh, um, these, uh, these uh, doctors with um, um, reasonable, uh, affordable, and uh, small in size um, test devices to um, um, get a bet better, better access to, the, to, the, uh, to finishing the pandemic situation? Um, therefore, um, so in general, we want to bring test and production opportunities closer to the point of need. Um, therefore, we um, have to fill a gap. We are in laboratory situations. We, all, we often have uh, big devices, um, um, costly devices that they are accurate, very accurate and very good, but um, not very um, um, suitable for, for um, a widespread um, um, of care diagnostic and on the other hand um, the, the more or less accurate um, uh, devices from drug, from drugstore or pharmacies so we have to fill the gap with um, devices like the device from Genspeed from Austria they are already um, developed um, a system for um, actually uh, originally for MRSA de detection but nowadays they have redeveloped it for COVID-19 antibodies detection and um, they are already using um, three of our micro pumps for um, dosing some reagents. I will come back to that later. Um, so the motivation is uh, combining these, these two components to make 
that passive component from a, 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 a microfluidic chip to an active unit. And um, first, first tries at, in our laboratories were uh, using the uh, handling tray from microfluidic chip shop and uh, implementing pump modules with our micro pump directly in the uh, size of microscope slides and this, in the size of the microfluidic chip to be very close at the um, uh, microfluidic chip um, geometries. Um, that is that was is our first first idea, and um, that is something that is um, um, state of the state of our of our development um, um, direction at the moment. Um, and we will have a closer look when we look at our at the application that we have set up. But before that, we need to have a look at fluid dynamics um, to understand what is happening in the following applications. Um, as you've already learned in the in the last uh, presentation. We, um, if we have a look at um, uh, flow profiles um, in fluid dynamics, we normally talk about uh, laminar flows and uh, turbulent flows. And uh, these flow uh, profiles depend on geometry and velocity. Um, normally in microfluidics, um, we uh, are faced with very low velocities and um, low geometries. So the Reynolds number, which is characteristic for the flow profile, is very low. And that leads to the fact that we normally have um, laminar flows and um, only one direction um, uh, within the fluid. And uh, the cross flow is missing. Um, so far, the microfluids. Oh, um, uh, of course, the hagen Purcell law is um, valid for laminar flows and, um, and uh, corresponds to the um, Ohm's law. So in this situation, it is um, comparable to the, the current is comparable to um, to the uh, flow rate, and the voltage is comparable to uh, the pressure, and that might be necessary for un for getting better understanding of the micro pump. Um, a few words to the micro pump. Um, uh, it's very small in size. Um, it is able to pro promote both uh, liquids and gases um, directly. And um, uh, as I mentioned, it's definitely beneficial because, um, as you can see here, the, the uh, scale is just 35 millimeters in, in the one dimension, and it's only in thickness, it's just uh, four, mil four, mil four millimeters. And um, um, uh, a very big advantage is that we are um, using only one material, and um, we use a laser welding process for, for, for combining these parts so that we only have one material in contact with the, um, with the, uh, with the, with the liquid. Um, the typical specification is um, uh, flow rates from um, less than 10 microliters, something around one or two microliters per minute up to 12,000 microliters per minute. The, um, if, we, if we have a look at liquids, um, the back pressure is, uh, it is possible to, to evoke back pressures up to uh, one bar. <coughs> um, and for gases, we can go up to, uh, we can go to flow rates up to uh, 30, 30 uh, milliliter per minute. And um, we can evoke pressures of 150 millibar. The behavior of the micro pump is uh, within a rising um, uh, back pressure in the, in the, in the system. The, um, the, uh, Flow rate behaves linear, so that corresponds directly to the uh, hagen purcell law. And um, or, uh, if you if you if you're more in electronics, you can com compare that to the Ohm's law. Um, one of the applications that we have set up with Microflake Chip Shop in, in the last few weeks is um, mixing liquids. We have actually released a video on that uh, yesterday. Um, as I said before, um, the laminar flow leads to um, the fact that. Um, um, and because we have only one direction of the two fluids, um, that these uh, these flows would not uh, spontaneously mix um, in each other. So we need uh, to have um, um, uh, intelligent uh, uh, or smart um, designed uh, structure, as Microflip Shipshop has uh, done so, um, to uh, evoke these cross flows. So we uh, go in that ship with um, um, two different colored liquids. And you can see in this in this um, in this first part of the chip that these two liquids are very well separated from from each other. And as soon as we get in these pearl chains, um, uh, the chip evokes cross flows, and we have a well processed mix mixture in, in the end. Um, another another um, application could be a cell culturing process. 
um, we have um, tested with um, um, a cell culture medium and um, a bioreactor chip for cell culturing for microfluidic chip shop, um, um, implementing some FZMB beads um, for simulating non adherent cells. And we were able to um, um, fill uh, and um, promote the cell culture medium um, in a loop through that uh, bioreactor. And we could uh, we have tested a uh, flow range from zero uh, from three microliter per minute up to 900 microliter per minute, and we have seen that these um, um, non-adherent uh, cells um, were washed out um, above 700 microliter per minute. So um, in uh, in the in the range up to 700 microliter per minute, um, the, uh, the cell culture medium um, would not affect the position of the of the of the um, cells. Um, and here I would like to show you a best practice. One of our customers, as I said before, is already um, using um, three of our micro pumps for three reagent, uh, reagents in their ELISA system. Um, um, actually, it was developed for MRSA. But um, as I said before, nowadays they've uh, redeveloped it and um, um, are working with a microfluidic chip, you would just simply implement that microfluidic chip in that system. And our micro pumps are dosing enzymes, chemistry luminescence, and a wash buffer solution. And um, this system already uh, um, 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 delivers a result within uh, only 15 minutes. So this system already fills a bit um, the, the gap from the beginning of the presentation between the strip test and the expensive and big and um, um, uh, with a long duration uh, lab ELISA tests. Um, it's, um, it, it's, it has, has a very good accuracy. It's easy to handle. It's mobile. It can be implemented in all general practitioners um, 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 uh, uh, homes. And um, the, the, the speed definitely is much, much less than um, the, the lab ELISA tests. And um, to give you a quick idea, what we are doing within the next few weeks is again um, um, de uh, developing um, a, a circuit board for the micro pump in combination with an SLF 3X uh, uh, sensor from Sensirion for um, uh, dosing um, very low flow rates. Uh, um, um, and you can directly um, address these uh, pump modules, which fit in a handling tray by Microfluid Chip Shop um, via USB or a wireless connection, or you can just plug and play it in, with, uh, in your PC. And we have already um, set up these uh, flow control PID regulated um, uh, systems. We have got them as a standalone system. We just um, optimize them for, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, implementing them in these handling trays. So you actually can, very, you've got a very easy access. You can just type in your, your, your requested and desired flow rate. And in the end, um, uh, these uh, micro, micro pumps the, or these pump modules can uh, dose a certain amount of liquid uh, in that, um, in that uh, handling tray. So um, we, would really uh, we really want to um, um, extend these passive microfluidic chips to active systems. Um, because we think these uh, systems can be slim, small, and affordable. Um, digital handling and documentation is very easy in, this, in these cases. And we can go to mobile applications um, like point of care diagnostics or organ chips for bringing the, these um, um, opportunities, these test and production opportunities, very close to the point of need. Um, as I said before, um, we have released a, a, a video on YouTube yesterday regarding um, the, the mixing liquids uh, application. If you, uh, if you would like to, you can have a look. Uh, here's, here's, here's the link. And um, thank you for your attention. Uh, a very special thanks goes out to um, Microfix Ship Shop and Zenzerian and Genspeed, um, three of our um, uh, um, partners. And um, if you would like to contact me um, after the presentation, here are my contact details. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm. Give me one second.
Um, yeah. Um, and it was interesting. Now we have two different uh, micro pumps uh, in the presentation. Uh, both of them have different fancy aspects. Um, a question to you, first of all, Florian, when you have a permanent um, use of your micro pump, how long does it stand um, the, the application? So that means if you're running the, uh, the device in your gen speed system, uh, permanent use, how long uh, is a lifetime? Um, we guarantee 5,000 hours due to the fact that our piezo actuator supplier is only guaranteeing 5,000 hours. We, mm -hmm. we, of, we, we um, of course, we do our uh, own lifetime tests in-house and we've seen that, um, especially regarding um, liquids, um, our micro pumps easily stand 10,000 hours. Okay. Um, may I uh, get the same question um, to um, John from TPP Ventures? How long is your system running? Sorry, I was just unmuting my microphone there. Um, yeah, our, our technology is um, a little bit different to, to any other pump technology in the fact that life for us um, is a different thing. We very rarely have a catastrophic failure. You know, the piezo actuator we use you know, will run on for many, many thousands of hours. It's the, the valve inside our pump that is the life determining element. So okay. depending on how hard you run it, um, that can determine the life. So we too have got a, a 5,000 hour pump um, that's available now. Uh, we're going to be shortly releasing a 10,000 hour pump, but you know we we ex fully expect to push our life um, you know into sort of the tens of thousands of hours going forward okay. um, as we improve the valve technology. Yeah. So that, that's always an interesting question, um, Florian. Back th uh, thanks. Florian, back to, back to you when you do this. I always call this microfluidics logo and that's uh, Lego and um, yeah, playing around with these devices. Um, do you have a plan to expand this platform that you really can plug and pay pumps and, and various other devices? Uh, so that means to make a real family out of this when Sensirium is on board, that's always great. True, uh, sure, yeah. We are, we are actually um, um, cooperating with many, with many com companies at, at the moment, like um, Microfluid Chip Shops and Zerion, um, Honeywell, and, um, um, and the, um, Active Valve Producers, for example. So we really want to um, make a family out of it. And we want to have uh, standalone devices. And in, uh, in this particular situation for uh, Microfluid Chips, we um, would uh, uh, like to start with these... Um, um, Handling trays, pump modules, and um, um, always with a micro pump, and um, then you can, uh, um, and that is uh, that is a vision. Um, then you can decide whether you need a pressure control um, uh, system or a flow control system, and then you can just uh, choose the right sensor, um, which we may have already uh, selected for. Okay, that's great. So. Um, can everybody still hear me? I assume yes. Yes. Okay. So Wilhelm Gerdes uh, cannot make it today uh, unless uh, it, this has changed, but I do not assume this now. Um, that means we have a couple of minutes to discuss and um, there are some topics um, of interest, obviously cost but also uh, failure modes and stuff like this. So there, uh, I would like to ask uh, Holger Becker to give us a five to 10 minutes impression on failure modes and microfluidics. Um, and then we can discuss the, um, yeah, more or less the, the reliability uh, factor and uh, also, um, yeah, advantages and also illusions uh, and further topics in microfluidics. Okay, can we go yeah. it like this? Okay, I'll, I'll jump in and do a not perfectly spontaneous uh, presentation here. Uh, basically, uh, because we talk about a lot on the commercial development of Microflix, it's of course interesting to look a little bit at failure modes because in, normally you learn more from failures than from successes. And um, if we look into the history of Microflix, of course, the field is, is really littered with uh, bodies of dead companies, which is nothing specific for microfluidics, but basically any new technology has a large uh, death rate. 
But as I mentioned, you, you learn more from these failures than from successes. And what is interesting actually in recent years, as I mentioned actually in my previous presentation, we see more projects failing for non-technical reasons, commercial reasons, marketing reasons, and so on, uh, market acceptance, than for technical reasons. And it's actually worth to have a look at that. Um, if you look in the classical uh, management literature on you know, failures, uh, this is sort of the kind of diagram you typically see, uh, which basically shows you uh, the amount of cash flow over time. And it's clear you know, in the early stages you burn, um, let's see, just a different way. You, you, you burn money, so you have a negative cash flow, and then you have sort of various exit channels. So of course, if during development, it turns out the device doesn't work, your company dies uh, very quickly. Uh, but then you have a phase where basically the technical development is over. You start to sell things. And then you also have various exit, exit modes. So something where nobody more or less wants to buy the device, so you die. Then you have these companies who maybe have carved out a certain niche. And this actually, I find um, a totally acceptable business model. Not everybody has to grow to Google size. And then, of course, you have these uh, let's say the financial investors uh, wet dreams of companies who, of course, become really big and, and financially very successful. However, when I look at diagrams like that, um, I find it a little bit lim limited in the sense that this is a, a purely financial point of view. And I think it's more interesting to look at a, at a broader horizon, at a more holistic uh, picture here. Um, when I started my commercial career more than 20 years ago, I had actually the naive um, understanding that a success rate for product development would be uh, correlated to a company size in the sense that a bigger company, a big corporation has many more tools, more experience to bring a product to the market. So they should be more successful. Turns out actually now after more than 20 years in industry that at least my, in my private statistics, the success rate is independent of company size. What is different or what, what, what is different with regard to company size, however, are the failure modes. And that's what I would like to talk a little bit about. Um, typical failure modes for small companies, startups, um, is that, of course, they develop the wrong product in the sense that it works technically, but uh, nobody want, well, after the technical development, nobody wants to buy it. Uh, so there is a missing market acceptance. Um, there are just picked two uh, examples here from history. The one was one of the first lap on a CD devices from Gamera uh, launched in 2000. Um, the other one, for example, is the rain dance droplet device. Um, what both of these uh, products have in common is they were very disruptive. In 2000, you know, everybody, all the pharma companies, and this was a product which was directed towards pharma, um, had just invested heavily in high throughput screening, you know, all the big lab robots and stuff like that. And of course, nobody throws away a million dollar investment because somebody else, especially a startup comes around and says, oh, I have the next cool thing, which is a lab on a CD. Um, with Rain Dane, some, something similar. I mean, it was basically droplet based um, procedures for biotech. And there is no macroscopic equivalent to a, to a two-phase flow with oil and water. And whoever, anyone who has ever worked with that knows that it can be a pretty messy thing. Um, and Rain Dance actually highlighted their disruptiveness. And again, it scared people away. Nobody wanted to buy it. So it's, both of these products were technically working, but yeah, failed in market acceptance because they were very disruptive. They were not really user-oriented, not really understanding the need of users. And both of these systems would not integrate well into existing workflows. So that's really one of the crucial, in, our, in my opinion, uh, success factors is how well does your system integrate into existing workflows? Um, the second typical failure mode, of course, for small companies is you simply run out of money. You underestimate how much it takes, how much time it takes for technical development. But also, of course, you underestimate that once the technical development is over, you still burn money because, I mean, you first have to enter the market and during the first time on the market, you're still earn less than what you burn. So uh, that is typically a failure mode for small companies. Uh, and another example here from a German company, 
pretty cool device, actually ahead of its time in the sense it was a miniaturized 96 volt plate looking for um, antibiotic susceptibility. Um, yeah, uh, took too long, my company ran out of money. So the product really never made it to the market. The third one is actually just the opposite. And uh, this is mainly true for US companies. And uh, from a European perspective, of course, you can start weeping if you read that you know US companies raise whatever $50 million in a, in a series A funding or so. Um, but that actually can be dangerous. And I call it the curse of too much money in the sense that you're, if you have that much money uh, being invested in your company through mostly venture capital companies, they don't want that money to sit in the bank account, but they want you to spend the money. And that can lead to losing the focus. And my, my, pic, uh, my picture book example for this is uh, Nanogen, one of the early high profile startup companies in microfluidics, which were, had a really cool technology, active arrays, because they knew that um, DNA uh, is negatively charged. So you can actually uh, speed up uh, DNA array technology by orders of magnitude if you actually have your hybridization probes on an on an electrical uh, on an electrode and you can charge this electrode and you pull your DNA molecules towards the hybridization partners. They raised some more than two hundred million dollars, but totally lost focus in developing a product. They were totally in love with the te technology and ca came up with hundred different applications of the technology. But if you don't develop a product, in the end, all the, the $200 million are gone and the company is gone. So this is a very American problem, but losing focus can be really a challenge for uh, startup companies. And then finally, of course, um, the question of personnel. Um, and that's especially true for startups or spin-offs from academic institutions. I mean, not every great scientist makes a good entrepreneur. I mean, sounds trivial, but actually, this insight um, has a lot to do with how honest people are amongst themselves. And then of course, you always have the situation like uh, uh, shown here. I mean, uh, this is de definitely recommended reading for anyone in our field in, in diagnostics. Of course, if somebody really, um, let's say, um, wants to mislead people, there's very little you can, you can do about that. And, and for sure, Theranos had a significantly negative impact on the capability of companies to raise money in the point of care diagnostic field. If we look towards large corporations, the failure modes are pretty different. By far the predominant one is actually management decisions. Uh, we're merging, we're selling this part of the company, we have a CEO which shelves all the projects of his predecessor, we have a new pro uh, a product strategy, we have to concentrate on our core business. So all totally non-technical reasons, which also have nothing to do with the actual quality of your product. It's only management decisions, only corporate reasons. And this is very, very typical for large corporations. And again, in my experience, if you have a project with a large corporation and you don't have a direct champion, a person on a pretty high managerial level who is fighting for your product, the probability that you actually end up with a successful product development is pretty slim. If you have you know, a, a, a project manager who changes every 12 months or so, that's already a, a big red warning light. And my textbook example here is the Philips Minicare system um, developed over some like 15 years for, with a lot of money, uh, was launched in 2006, uh, 16, sorry, um, with you know, big bang and big drums and got lots of prices, uh, so big PR. In 2017, Philips decided to go out of the IVD business. So just closed more or less within a very short amount of time. Um, actually 2019, Siemens bought that unit. But of course, by that time, a lot of the, the, the people were gone. Uh, and I haven't heard anything about it after Siemens acquired it. So I have to see how that works out. And the second uh, failure mode for big corporations, of course, is the classical non-invented here syndrome. It's a typical situation. <laughs> Uh, uh, when you, you, know, you go to a first meeting uh, with a big corporation client and you have 10 or 15 engineers sitting opposite you on the table and yeah, they all think, you know, it's, we, know we know this much better. We have done it always like this and this. Uh, so yeah, that's a, a, again, a, a fairly non-technical uh, 
purely psychological problem. And the same here, <clears throat> um, over engineering, that's actually a failure mode which we find both in small and large corporations, however, uh, with a slightly different tone to it. In small corporations, because they don't know better, <clears throat> we often see that the ex expectations for the new product are far too high and very often pretty unrealistic uh, with regards like tolerances or cost for scale up or stuff like that. In the large corporations, the over engineering is more classical in the sense that they want to cram too many features into the part or into the system, or it has to be compatible with five systems they already have in the market. And then of course, they, they're sort of mutually exclusive uh, requirements they have. And again, cost expectations tend to be uh, unrealistic. So what are the lessons learned in, in this discussion here? The first thing is, um, be patient and realistic, both with regards with, with time and money. I mean, this is a, a graph I have nicked from uh, one of Sam Sia's pretty frequently quoted paper in LabChip on 2012, where he looked in sort of in the commercialization of cartridge-based microfluidic devices for diagnostics. And of course, you can see here, I mean, it's a pretty scattered plot with regards to time and money. So years from founding the company to getting a first product out and the money needed. But it turns out that you have sort of a center of gravity, which would be somewhere here, which basically means you need, let's say, five, seven years until you have a product and some $10 million. And it's always pretty challenging if you have customers coming to you say, we want to have a really complex molecular diagnostic system within 12 months and for a million dollars. You then have to, I, I always show that picture then and tell them, you know, we can try it, but you would be here. And just you know statistically, it's pretty improbable that this will work. Um, the second one is just simply be aware of these failure modes. I mean, once you realize that these failure modes are uh, there, you might actually start, you might introduce strategies to actually alleviate or at least minimize the impact of these failure modes. Um, and as I mentioned in my previous talk, I think on the other hand, what we always can say now on the technical side is that we get all the devices to work. So we should really move uh, with regards to risk assessment away from the purely technical discussion, more towards questions of, of the market, market acceptance, product layout, customer satisfaction, workflow integration and stuff like that. So in the end, of course, the big question, you know, is microfluidics uh, a highway to hell or a stairway to heaven? And of course, coming from the company, I'm always uh, prefer this one. And actually, I don't even prefer that um, sort of uh, title wise, I would also prefer that music wise. So with this, I think I filled the slot pretty easily. And uh, yeah, this uh, would probably could also be a basis for a few minutes of discussion. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Holger, for stepping in here and also giving this nice uh, history, in particular for all the ones being uh, since a while in microfluidics who have experienced all of these companies you had on your, on your drawing and suffered with them when they failed and were fascinated with them when new technology popped up and showed the work. Um, yeah, some, some comments here. Uh, my nasty comments on yeah, what, what are the costs of the device uh, is something uh, that all of the companies heard meanwhile. Um, another thing what you mentioned now is over-engineering and making it easy. Um, there may be also the, the question to, um, to Bartels microtechnology with the approach, okay, uh, playing Legos is on the one hand fascinating, on the other hand, maybe also a way to make things easier. Can you give two statements on this, Florian? Uh, pardon, can you, could you please repeat the question? <laughs> Simply um, from over engineering to make it easy by having modules and playing Lego with microfluidic sensors, sure. pumps and things like this. Sure. Um, our, our main idea behind that, behind that pump module was um, um, you, you often have um, 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 syringe pump or pumps or something like this. So we want to, we want to make, make everything a bit smaller um, a bit more affordable because our pumps are much more affordable 
much more affordable than syringe pumps, pumps for example. And um, just playing uh, Ligu, like uh, like you like, like you lo like to say, um, um, makes um, um, uh, gives gives a quick access to uh, playing around with um, uh, microfluidic chips and uh, micro pumps. And um, um, as you are able to to use uh, user interfaces uh, that we are developing, um, you have a very very fast access to to um, getting in touch with microfluidics and and. Um, um, our micro pumps and, the, and, and your chips, for example. So it's really like playing around at first and um, like a little child and um, um, very easy. So that is and very simple. Okay. So modules in contrast to over engineering. Okay, yeah. now we are back on our time schedule and we move from Germany to Austria. Uh, and learning about uh, some technological points in roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing of microfluidic devices. And Anja Hase will show what uh, the Ioannium Research Center is doing in Graz. Um, yeah, Anja, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me and I hope you can see my screen quite soon because I have to yeah, share it. So can you see yes. my screen? Okay. Now I try to start the presentation as well. Good. Um, so welcome after lunch or maybe just before lunch. Um, what I would like to do is to give you an insight in a new technology or not new to us, but new to you, you maybe. It's a high throughput roll to roll production of lab on chips. Actually, we have many applications, but we want to show production of lab on chips. I'm Anja Hase. I'm from Jonerm Research. That's an Austrian research company, a bit like Fraunhofer in Germany. So we are not really fabricating yet, but I think we have a quite interesting technique. I don't have to start with this motivation, probably, because you all know why we are here. We know that microfluidic-based lab-on-chip devices, they offer new solutions in medicine, pharmacy, monitoring, especially now at COVID situation and that the biosensor chip market is continuously growing. That's at least what we hope. And one of the problems is, as we heard in the first talk, that the unit costs are still high. We are aiming for a one euro design and the production throughput is low. So that was the motivation. And our solution is a high throughput production of lab on chips by roll to roll UV imprinting. So what we do is we fabricate chips on a polymer film substrate and we have certain advantages. We can fabricate hundreds of chips per minute because we have a parallel processing. We don't have the need of individual chip handling and we can fabricate na nano and micro patterns in one step. And we can use them as I said for different applications like optical, capillary um, sensor functionalities and capillary functionalities, but also for lab on chips. And that's what I will talk about today. So the outline of my talk is I will give you a short introduction in roll to roll UV nano imprint lithography. I will touch the topic of materials because with materials, you can really tune your properties as we have heard on previous talks and which is also very essential for our technique. And then I will touch the fabrication of one example chip and an in vitro diagnostic lab on chip and how we could improve it with roll to roll UV nano imprint lithography. So the principle of roll to roll UV nano imprint lithography of micro and nano imprinting is quite simple. You might know it already. <clears throat> and it's a very well, basic method for replicating micro and nano structures. So what you need is, well, if you can see my mouse, you need a polymer substrate or any kind of substrate and an imprint resin, which is a UV curable resin. And what you also need is a stamp with a relief structure you want to replicate. So you simply place the stamp in the resin and while they are in contact, you cure it with UV light, you remove the stamp and have transferred your structure. This curing process can be done with UV light, as I said, or also with temperature or a combination of both. And the big advantages is that you are very flexible with respect to geometries, size and forms, and that the lateral resolution is independent on the optical wavelength, which is not so important for microfluidics because you have large structures, more or less large structures. But we started with organic electronics and you know that for electronics, the 
lateral resolution is very, very critical. And the big advantage to photolithography is that you can go for very, very small resolutions with this technique. And we're not doing a manual imprinting, but a roll-to-roll -roll imprinting. You have the same principle. So have, you have a polymer substrate. You coat it with a liquid UV curable resin, and you have your structure rolled up. And when the resin is in contact with the stamp, with the roller, you cure it from the backside with UV light. And then you have transferred the structure into the resin. At your near research, we have a pilot line. So it's not really for very fast production yet, but we can show the principle. And we have a substrate width of 25 centimeter and can go with speeds up to 30 meter per minute. And this is just um, a very short video how this principle works. So the blue one is the liquid resin, and then um, it touches the stamp and is cured from the backside with UV light and you have transferred the structure. I think this video gives just a very nice insight how this structuring works. And here's just some pictures of structures we have achieved. On the left-hand side, there are no microfluidic structures, but more bionic structures and line space grids with very fine resolution and high aspect ratio. But here on the right-hand side, you can see some different microfluidic structures like pumps and filters and things like this. And I just added this one because it reminded me of this nice rainbow color microfluidic we have seen before. That's a filled chip with different colored liquids. I said I'll touch the topic of materials because we are using a UV curable resin. And if you know your resin, you can really tune your properties of the lab on chip you're fabricating. So for the lab on chips, what we need is a fast curing resin because we want to go with high speed imprinting. We want a low water contact angle. We don't want any swelling, swelling. And of course, we don't want cytotoxicity and normally low autofluorescence as well. And what we usually use is a mixture of an acrylate oligomer with polar groups for the hydrophilicity. Then we can add thiols as anchor groups for the biofunctionalization and increased elasticity. And then also we add or can add some additives for super wetting properties. And in the following, I'm just giving you examples how the shape of the surface, but also the material can influence the properties of your surface. So we have the same structure. So it's a riplet-like structure, so V lines in one direction. And if they are standing out, we have a super hydrophobic property. So the droplet is really dancing on our paper. On the right-hand side, we have the same structure, but turned around. So we have V grooves. And as you can see in this video, we have a super wetting property. So the water droplet really flows within these V lines. And another example on the next slide where we have tested a very elastic resin. Again, we have this picture of the V lines in a quite elastic resin. But as you can see, it's just a normal needle under the microscope. It really destroys the Riblets when you scratch over the sample. Now we change to a very, very elastic resin. And as you can see, the riblets are not destroyed at all and the needle will turn in a minute. And you can see that even if you push the riblets, so it, it should come quite soon, then they are not even destroyed. So with tuning the properties, you can really achieve quite good surface properties. But that was the material section. Now I'll come to my application, the diagnostic chip platform. And it was quite advantageous that the previous talk was not present because then you can still rem remember the ChenSpeed technology, the ChenSpeed device, which Bartlett was talking about. We are also using this, but what we are using or what we are developing are uh, the chip platform. So we started with a commercial device, the ChenSpeed system, which uses a lab on chip platform um, when we started this project, um, COVID was not a topic yet. So we started with a detection of a DNA-based diagnostic for bacteria for the methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is a very important but unwanted bacteria in hospitals because it's resistant to antibiotics and you definitely don't want to have this in hospitals. So it's quite important to have a fast, reliable test to detect it. So what GenSpit or the system uses is a 
microfluidic chip and um, the flow is driven by capillary forces so we don't need any pumps and in the beginning it consisted of a injection molded top part with the microfluidics and a counterfoil a polysubs uh, polystyrene substrate with immobilized um, dna stripes detection is chemoluminescence based and the whole um, measuring takes about seven to nine minutes so the chip is mounted together you can see the inlet and the reaction channel and a waste reservoir and then this chip is mounted into the chance speed device and the reaction can start so this chance speed device is as we already had in the first talk what we need a sample in read out result out device so quite a simple one um, as i said we have a chemoluminescence detection and in the, in the device on the bottom we have photodiodes which um, detect the chemoluminescence or the, the height of the signal we planned several improvements with roll to roll the first one is we wanted to include optical structures to enhance the chemoluminescence signal the outcoupled signal the second step is we wanted to replace the injection molded part with a microfluidic structure because then we get rid in this this type of system of any individual chip handling because we can handle everything on the roll to roll machine and finally, we also set up a new roll-to-roll -roll system, a roll-to-roll -roll micro spotter to um, immobilize the DNA sensor molecules and again have a further step to process automation. I will start with the optical structures. They have been simulated within a project and then fabricated and together with the company Microresist Technology, um, they developed a resin which was where the refractive index was matched to the polystyrene substrate so that you don't have any additional reflections and the idea is to mount them on the bottom of the bottom foil so that you reduce the internal reflections which would occur in the substrate and <clears throat> the top part of this first chip was um, an injection molded chip here you can see some pictures that's the role of imprinted optical structures then the DNA molecules were capillary printed on top of these, well, on one hand side with structures, without structures, a bare polystyrene, polystyrene substrate, and then they were mounted to the injection molded part. And of course, we wanted to compare these signals and measure both in the chance bit device. And as you can see, there are different DNA stripes. And the inst interesting one, which you should focus on, is the Staphylococcus aureus, the MEC C and the MEC A. So we measured both samples several times in, a, in the device. And as you can see, the gray one is the uh, output without optical structures and the green one with optical structures. And as you can see, we really improved the sensor signal by a factor of 1.7. And even if we diluted the sample, we could improve the detection limit. And this was quite a nice result for this project. And we have also won an Austrian prize for this two years ago, which we are quite proud. And all these results now were just recently published in Lab on Chip, and we got the inner front cover of the latest issue and just want to advertise this as well. The second step was the replacement of the injection molded part. So here on the left side, you see the injection molded part, and we wanted to have a roll to roll imprinted one. As you can see, the layout is changing, mainly due to one reason. A big advantage of injection molding is that you can fabricate quite deep structures. That's something we are limited in roll to roll UV imprinting. Up to now, we have managed 100 micrometer depth. And if you need a lot of waste reservoir, that's not sufficient. So that's why we had put the waste reservoir on the side of the chip. We filled the whole chip area with our waste. The sensor channel is still in the middle. And that is, that's a typical design of the master and then it's replicated um, for the role and then here you see the role to role replication and again we wanted to know if we have the same results with the injection molded and the role to role imprinted fluidic structure and as you can see with this graph is that we have similar performance with our role to role imprinted structure so we can directly use this technique to uh, re replace the injection molded technique and the last step <clears throat> I'm talking about, or the last part, is that we want a further step of automation. 
So we are using role-to-role -role micro spotting for functionalization instead of the capillary printing. And another big advantage is that with this micro spotting, we need less material and these DNA probes can be quite expensive. So you want to use as little as, li as possible of material. It's a stop and go process. So that's why we used a different or an extra system and not a roll to roll imprinting machine. So we mount the roll into this device and then um, it always drives a little bit and it's sucked uh, uh, with the vacuum table and the spotter starts looking for the fiducial and then spots the DNA probes. And on the back side, which you can't see, is a UV lamp, which cures the immobilized DNA spots. So this brings me nearly to the end of my talk. So the improvements of the lab on chip we made, and which I hopefully showed you with the roll-to-roll -roll imprinted optical microstructures for the enhanced chemoluminescence outcoupling, then I showed you that with the roll-to-roll -roll imprinted structures, we can replace injection molded parts and hopefully be cheaper. And with the roll-to-roll -roll spotted sensor probes, we have an even further step for automation. And as a conclusion of my talk, I hoped that I could show you that roll-to-roll -roll UV needle is a powerful high throughput fabrication technique, also for microfluidics and dust lab on chips. And concerning all the questions and discussions before. I think that with roll-to-roll -roll UV needle, you can come in the area of one euro per chip if, if it's just the chip you're talking of. Um, with roll-to-roll -roll UV needle, you can have, have any many other applications, uh, which I didn't show, but optical elements is one, bionic surfaces, decorative foils, and organic electronics. As long as you know your materials, and that's also a know-how we have in-house. Then I showed you that the transfer of injection molded chips to roll-to-roll -to -roll fabrication is possible and that we have set a further step to full, fully automation our system with the roll-to-roll -roll microspotting. If you think this technique is somehow interesting, I have two advertisements in the end. We have two European projects which are running at the moment. One is an open innovation testbed which is called next-gen microfluidics, where we want to bring this technique, this roll-to-roll -roll imprinting, roll-to-roll -roll microspotting to further, to further applications. And you can apply there for small projects, which are funded by the European Union. And the second one is a bit similar, but it's what's well, called MEPFAP. It's um, coordinated by VTT. It is also a pilot line for advanced photonic med medical devices. And there we also have a part where we can fabricate microfluidics with the roll to roll machine. And MedFab has also an online booth here at the Compamet company. And as a last slide, I would like to, well, that's just the, the partners of these two projects, but I would, would like to acknowledge all our funding, our partners, GenSpeed, MRT, InMold for fabricating the shim, and all my co workers at Uneum Research. And with this, I'm at the end of my presentation. Okay, thanks Anja for giving this nice introduction into the role to role structuring and uh, the benefits of this technology. Um, and there is time for a few questions. What I have on my list is uh, in the first instance, a technical question. Um, or to inter intervene uh, technical question, what the maximum um, structure depth you can currently achieve and what's the diameter of your mold insert in the roller to roller uh, yeah, structuring? So the maximum depth we achieved so far was about 100 micrometer, but on two sides of the substrate. So we had another application where we had to structure both sides of the uh, substrate for a decorative reason. And we had 100 micrometer structures on both sides. So I would guess that maybe if you have a roller stamp, you could also go for 200 micrometer on one side. And um, I think the question, the second question was about our roller width. Well, that's depending on the machine you have or the, the, the diameter. Ours is a six inch roller. So we have a, a stamp size of 60 centimeter times 30 centimeter, but that's depending on the machines you have. 
VTT also has a UV imprinting machine with the same size because we adapted to their size because we want to be mm. compatible. But if you are thinking of big companies, you can have this any size you want. I would guess not any size. No, because no but you can be larger <laughs> and even yeah. wider. I know that Temicon also has a machine and I think they can go up to one meter width. Yeah, that, so was that, that, that always is, is interesting when you're imagining you have this large wheel to, to structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, then uh, obviously I need to make this final point. You pointed out the $1 uh, is feasible. Yes, the $1 is feasible. I think the other guys will uh, <laughs> will agree with this if the device is rather rather easy because you, you showed um, a de device eventually with reagents and but nothing more. And I, I'm pointing out this because otherwise we never got rid of this illusion from everybody, you can have microfluidics with valves, with reagent, with everything inside for a dollar. And I'm fighting for this since years. So that means, yes, easy devices, they can be affordable. But if you would like to have reagents that already cost beyond the couple of dollars, uh, you will never make a one dollar device. So let yeah. me stress this. Otherwise, I get, uh, I always will get this interesting question. Please make me a one dollar device with all reagents embedded. No. Okay. <laughs> May I just answer to this? Um, I, I totally agree. And when we were discussing about prices, it said um, our chip is not allowed to be more than one dollar or one euro because the reagents also cost some money and the total amount doesn't is, is not allowed to be too high. So for the chip, we had the requirement not to be above one dollar. And I think that's something we could achieve. But if you need reagents, of course, they will cost more. And all other functionality, yeah. you have a structured device with no no real functions, and then you you can get this. But it's a really fascinating technologies. I've been looking in this, and I will probably contact you on some with some further questions and maybe also ideas. Okay, now let's move to our last uh, presentation for today, Thomas. You are online and uh, let us know something about the dosing of small volumes um, and uh, also fancy reagents in these extremely small volumes. As I pointed out, uh, Alexios is the guy for chocolate. You are the guy for wine. Um, so, it's but you can also handle small <laughs> volumes. <laughs> okay. Sure. So, Claudia, thank you very much for uh, giving me, of course, here the opportunity for presentation. And uh, yeah, thank you uh, also for, uh, from, for Holger doing so. And yeah, Claudia, just to point out, very interesting screen in the back. Yeah. Okay. So now to the presentation, which is uh, titled Toward Highly Sensitive uh, Point of Care Testing using linear uh, cryo uh, airways. Uh, yeah, this is a very interesting presentation, I guess, for all of the companies I have noticed today, which are also working and presenting uh, pumps. So that's somehow a <laughs> comment from my side in advance. And yeah, I'm a member of the University of Freiburg here. We have uh, somehow yeah, 11 faculties. And of course, as we are university students, we have about now 7,000 uh, staff members. And yeah, I am part of here, the Department of Microsystem Engineering, and uh, also in combination with the uh, computer sciences. And within this, I'm a member of the chair of uh, chemistry and physics of interfaces somehow. Nowadays, I should tell bio, biology, uh, chemistry, and physics of interfaces. Yeah, what we are doing, we are somehow working on different copolymers, which are relevant uh, for bioanalytics, which are uh, um, in agreement with the uh, biology. We are microstructuring, not making also micro, micro nanostructuring of surfaces. Yeah, we are changing, of course, the properties of the surfaces. Yeah, we want to combine the bioanalytics within these surfaces. This is my, my part, of course. And uh, yeah, within this, yeah, we, within, by time, we are handling now different surfaces, different plastics, glass, of course, also struct uh, structured uh, devices like uh, micro titter plates, foils, and um, micro areas are also a part of microstructuring. Uh, coating larger areas, uh, which could be biofunctionalized by coatings. 
And uh, one of the most important uh, reaction we are doing here, we are working with copolymers containing uh, benzophenone. Benzophenone is a uh, monophenone. One yeah? question. Uh, I do not see your screen. Ah. Up to oh. now, I could follow you and all of us because that was an introductory, but uh, I. Okay, 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 okay. So, 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 so. That means uh, again, we have to, yeah, this was somehow the part which was missing. So I hope so now. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I have forgotten that. So I will continue within this. Yes. I think you, are, you, you see the screen now. I guess that yes. was yes. the part I was somehow forgetting it. So but, uh, when I started the presentation. But you followed somehow, and it was uh, the introduction of the chair. So uh, I guess you can uh, easily imagine that. So uh, I was on this part, and I will also now making the presentation modus. So I want to continue here because of yeah, uh, this is a very interesting uh, part of our um, somehow a major part of our research here. Um, we are um, taking a look how can we biofunctionalize surfaces. Within this, we make uh, hydrogels. Uh, within this benzophenone monomer, I told you before, and uh, within UV light and in using this benzophenone, here we can make a so-called chick reaction, a CH insertion reaction. Within this, just mixing this copolymer within any kind of biomolecule. Here we are presenting an antibody, but also we can do that easily with uh, nucleotide acids polysaccharides, cells, even cells, and then we can, in a randomized way, but in a reproducible way, biofunctionalize these surfaces. And of course, the amplification and the application I uh, want to present today is also based on this reaction. And you can imagine, easy to handle, one-step reaction, just mixing somehow this copolymer solution with any kind of these biomolecules you don't have to activate or prepare the surface in it, uh, surfaces in advance. And yeah, this will be uh, is part of many research projects and uh, um, application projects, uh, including also essay development. And yeah, this is somehow my group actually at the moment, and this is my boss. And today now I want to address that lateral flow devices are of course one of the major uh, tools for point of care diagnostics. So we know that because of yeah, they are affordable, of course, easy to handle. We do not need any equipment fast, but we know that the sensitivity is not so high that in most cases we can just face one parameter assays, but not multi-parametric assays. We know that somehow, yeah, within the capillary forces, I guess, and I hope that all of you know about how this lateral flow device and assay is working with. We are putting here on a sample pad our uh, sample. Then uh, within these capillary forces, uh, the sample will be uh, uh, moving to the waste pad, but also bringing on the, the gold particles. Then at the end here, we have lines with the antibodies, which are then addressing these uh, proteins of interest. And within the colometric reaction, we will get then the lines. And this is how the LFA is working, but the sensitivity is a problem. What is the reason for? One is that these cellulose fibers are absorbing the proteins of interest, and that's a reason, a bottleneck of sensitivity. And the transparency of this two-dimensional device is also relatively poor. So we had the idea in a research project, why not thinking about a new tool, also very easy to produce, um, somehow um, mimicking uh, this uh, lateral flow, but getting rid of these bottlenecks. So we thought about the capillary, just 500 microns, just for five microliters or 20 microliters, 20 microliters. And yeah, also somehow storing the components in advance and then just making monoliths of the gel, as I um, explained to you before. 
uh, carrying uh, antibodies, proteins of interest, target uh, to, to capture the target proteins, or even not, so that we have somehow negative controls and somehow these uh, gel parts of interest, positive controls, somehow the same structure as we meet here for the lateral flow assay. So, and uh, how can we realize that? Somehow within the reaction, I told you before, we are mixing our biomolecules of interest. Then you should know by freezing this, solu this solution, we are getting phase separation. And then with a photo mask, of course, then we can get then areas where we have these monolites, these gels, and parts where we do not. And in this case, we are just have a cryogel, not a hydrogel, but the, the porosity is very high. So within this, and from the scientific point of view, that we need a little bit uh, a special concentration of this copolymer. So within 50 milligram per mil, in somehow 25 to 50 seconds, we have sent this gel. We can do that easily in an aqueous solution. And if also in PBS, which is the most uh, um, widespread uh, buffer for protein analysis, for example, we easily can realize these cryogels. And uh, we know that we can also control the porosity, which is also of interest because of thinking about uh, the samples that could be whole blood, could be serum, could be plasma, could be uh, urine. And somehow we can control this easily by reducing the temperature or in or somehow the concentration of the, of the polymer. Yeah? Within this, so we are aware of that we have in this case, the transparency of the nitrocellulose is very poor. And we know that the nitrocellulose or cellulose is also um, absorbing our proteins or our um, biomolecules of interest. And this, within this, this cryogel can get rid of it because of the cryogel, this, this capillary is three dimensional. That means we can measure any signal easily. And as we are working with uh, copolymers, which can avoid physisorption, so Within this, this is an absolute good and uh, feasible reason for that the sensitivity of this new target will be much better. So the manufacturing is also is very easy. We are just taking solutions. Some are one where we do not have any uh, antibody or any uh, target of interest. And then we have uh, di different other solutions with different biomolecules maybe for positive control. And so this is the way how we can produce these. Yeah? And then within the freezing and the uh, turning at the end, we have then this functional uh, capillary. And this is how the capillary looks like after this process. And now if you think about an example here in this case, we just have here the monolite without any biomolecule. Here, as we just made the first example of uh, detecting interleukin-6, this cytokine. So we here offered the antibody against interleukin-6. And here we have just the positive control for the detection, a biotinylated molecule involved here, BSA biotin, for example. And then pumping interleukin-6 through it, so you see Within this, we have um, the fluorescence readout and not the colorimetric readout. You can imagine as we are focusing that this capillary should replace later on the uh, lateral flow device. We know that the colorimetric detection is not even so, so sensitive as the fluorescence detection. So it makes sense to check this with the fluorescence and you see that we can easily uh, um, here realize this interleukin assay on it. And if we then think about in the quantification point of view and also see about what is the state of the art in the literature, we see 
that within this vocabulary, we can easily, easily get the same or even better the, uh, the uh, limit of detection as state of the art. So, um, thinking about now that in many areas of point of care that uh, uh, diseases play a role, in this case, somehow multiparametric assays, we enlarge this to uh, dual fluorescence aspects. In this case, we are thought about, yeah, we have this, uh, um, we have this capillary with a dilution, and we know that the ratio between uh, immunoglobulin G and M plays a crucial, crucial role for different diseases. So we made it and we just uh, took uh, red for recognizing interleukin, uh, <laughs> immunoglobulin M and uh, the green channel for immunoglobulin green, uh, immunoglobulin G. And we, within this project, we also involved a company for building a point of care reader, smartphone based. And uh, you just see here um, a picture of it. And we made at the end a study and the study we made with a relatively popular uh, disease, uh, this Lyme disease. And uh, we know that we here have to make a study in a multi-parametric way. And uh, yeah, in this case, this is an example where this EGM to EGG ratio plays a role. And what we did, we just made this capillary. We are offering in our monolites different proteins of this Borrelia bacteria, which is responsible for this disease. We are offering the, cellule, uh, the, the, the sample, and we are then uh, detecting with our um, antibodies, fluorescent labeled antibodies. And we made a comparison with the lateral flow. And yeah, the study was comparing at the end 108 samples. And we have seen comparing to commercially available, highly sensitive readers that by diluting, yeah, uh, in the case, diluting, uh, the increasing the dilution of our uh, sample, we then get very good for the first one. I have to tell you for the first one, very good uh, um, results in agreement yeah, to the state of the art. And this was pretty amazing for, of course, future studies. And uh, yeah, the next part, what we also have to, of course, take care of that, yeah, equipment free is also very important. So we have to, to, uh, to take a look, how can we somehow organize it in a, the, the, pass, uh, the passive uh, microfluidics in this case. And what we did here, we just took uh, uh, an ink, then we have here this wick on it, and we saw uh, have uh, filled our capillary with the gel, and you see just within 10 minutes, the solution can be sucked in, and you see that, yeah, it is possible to do so. But, but I can tell you, at the moment, we have this in an active flow version, and this is very interesting, as I've seen from John and from others, uh, good examples for um, um, pumps and microfluidic pumps, which are of great interest in my point of view. So this is what I wanted to present you today as, yeah, we have the lateral flow uh, device, which is of course most spread in the area of point of care. We know the disadvantages and here I want to present, or I presented a new technology within the transparency as 3D, also with tools to get a higher sensitivity. So also with the fluorescence readout in combination with a new point of care smartphone based uh, reader system. So at the end here, this could be a good system uh, in the future for somehow facing all the um, requirements for point of care diagnostics. It was at the end a collaboration uh, project within different partners uh, from Germany. And yeah, this is what I wanted to present today. And 
I am, of course, at the end, looking forward to any comments or any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Thomas, for this wonderful insight in, in a new technology uh, coming from the technology technological end that fancies me always. Um, and I have a, a couple of questions here. Um, what obviously start with some uh, manufacturing perspective, working with gel, um, you always have the challenge that gels dry. So that means what lo what's long-term stability one and second, how do you store it all? So at the moment, at the moment, we are storing them with buffer because of we are knowing the drying at the end uh, gives somehow, um, yeah, um, the, 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 the gel will sh uh, shrink and then the, at the end, the sensitivity is getting a little bit less. What that means, 5% less. So at the moment we are storing with a buffer, yeah? But we know uh, combining uh, our gel with uh, special particles, then we know that we get rid of this problem. Mm -hmm. And the storing could then be 12 months. Okay, thanks. Um, the question of fluid filling that popped up, you directly answers by getting uh, the, uh, yeah, more or less pointing at uh, TPP and their wonderful pump or alternatively bottles. Um, if you would like to have a real uh, complete uh, point of care device, you need to include the sample prep. So that means bringing your gel in a real microfluidic cartridge. Uh, so that would be a fancy topic um, to work on. And then you can report uh, in two years about um, your, your development in this direction. And we would be happy to be part of this. So, okay. Yeah, I see the point, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are perfectly in time. Um, thanks to all the presenters for starting uh, at the right time and finishing in uh, the given uh, amount of minutes for the really interesting topics uh, from technology providers uh, on the different level, like the roller to roller structuring, uh, the reagent integration, uh, or also materials uh, for um, yeah, pumping and actuations, uh, and as well to the system provider or microfluidic provider like Microliquid and um, also EMT from Switzerland. And finally also us from ShipShop to make, uh, provide the system uh, provider view making chips and instrument. And um, also thanks to um, uh, Michael Littwitt also pointing out essay development is always a tricky thing. Uh, we, we point at this as well and biology and technology bringing together to this topic and finally having affordable devices is a topic we would like to focus on in future. And with this, thanks to all of you. Hope to see you next year in real in Düsseldorf at the Compromit. And I say uh, Alexios will provide chocolate for this session and Thomas will uh, cater us with his own wine. And uh, let's see what Turinia has to offer. Okay, and uh, with this, I would like to close the session. Thank all of you. Thank Ifam for making this possible. We do not have much uh, technical problems. So that's always nice in virtual events. And with this, goodbye to everyone. See you next year in real with chocolate wine and something from Turinia. Bye. <laughs>